Greetings, Nadi friends. I'm very happy to have episode number 100 with uh, our great guests in here. Uh, everyone will introduce himself. And today uh, we are going to have a question. What did time tell? But before that, let's go into the introductions. I would say this first. <laughs> OK. Uh, my name is Negar Buban. I come from a Iranian Kurdish background. And I'm a, a musician, oud player. If you take me as a composer in my own uh, kind of music, I'm a composer and a musicologist. But more than anything, I uh, I've consider myself uh, a bit of a passion for music and understanding. That is the best way I can introduce myself, I guess. Thank you. May I, uh, Ross? Well, um, uh, I'm uh, Salah Din uh, Maraka. I'm a uh, uh, Jordanian uh, Qanun player and uh, a musicologist uh, working currently at the University of Freiburg as a research uh, associate at the Department of Musicology. Uh, and I'm, I mean, uh, interested in the uh, lengthy history of uh, uh, Eastern musical traditions in general and specifically in the Arab music uh, uh, musical tradition. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ross Daly. Um, I'm originally Irish, actually. And, uh, well, I've been involved in the study of various modal musical traditions over quite a number of years. And uh, I am the artistic director of the Musical Workshop Labyrinth on Crete, which is a, an educational facility where we uh, host seminars, masterclasses, and also concerts and other such events on a regular basis, focusing on the various modal musical traditions of the world. We now have branches of Labyrinth also on the island of Cyprus, in uh, Italy, in uh, Catalonia, in Spain, and also in Toronto, as well as the Labyrinth online platform. And all of these projects are all dedicated to the same basic uh, goal, which is to pr promote and cultivate interest in modal musical traditions and to help people who are interested in learning to find good teachers and uh, educational sources. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think uh, uh, let's go through a set of points that are really of interest to see uh, from your vast experience, uh, all of you, uh, in, in Makam and modal music, how do you see the interest in Makam and modal music today? Shall we take turns or we just talk at the same time? Ross, you are muted. Yes. Uh, well, uh, OK. <clears throat> Perhaps it's good to the order which we started with to continue in that order maybe is a good idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that each person uh, make their statement and then maybe a dialogue might actually come out of it uh, but it's nice to give each person a chance to say their to expose their their full uh, okay uh, but but i, I so, thought that this question would be lovely to start with you uh, but it's well, okay. the, the way you decide uh, as you wish as you wish really yeah i'm quite happy please, please. okay <clears throat> um well <clears throat> I suppose each of us is going to have a different perspective on that because each of us is from a different location. Myself, uh, I've, being from the Western world, when I started showing an interest in Makam and uh, Raga and Dastga and all these different modal entities, I was um, a 14 year old adolescent in the Western United States. And at that time, uh, it was not at all common or in any way fashionable for a young person to take an interest in such things. And uh, many people actually thought maybe I was not quite in my right mind. 
And, uh, but I continued with that interest because I was generally something which I loved so much I couldn't not do it. But what I've seen over the years uh, is that there has been an increase of, increasing interest in various modal musical traditions, uh, including, of course, Makam, uh, in the Western world, because uh, I think that there's a certain certain dead end in some ways to certain aspects of where music is going in the Western world and where it's been going, especially in the, during the 20th century. And I think that people started to look beyond the boundaries of their microcosm. Uh, also, the cultural myth was completely debunked during the latter part of the 20th century that, you know, which this cultural myth, which says, you know, Western Europe, Western European culture is above everything else and everything else is lesser. This fortunately, this myth was completely debunked during the second half of the, the 20th century. So that led to an increase of interest in Western people in musical cultures other than their own. Of course, we do have the the rather shallow phenomenon which is referred to as world music. But okay, that may be a sort of a, a mainstream tendency. But there is a real increase in people who are taking very seriously musical cultures of other parts of the world, and uh, who are studying these, these cultures very seriously and learning them very seriously. And uh, so I think that uh, that's a very, very positive thing in my view at any rate. I guess if, if I uh, talk about my experience, it would be interesting to see it in, in comparison to Ross's because uh, as a child, being born to a Kurdish family in Tehran, uh, but, but with parents who were interested in Western music as well, uh, Western classical mainly, uh, I was in a totally different uh, starting point kind of i mean i maram in the sense of kurdish maram was just normal dasgah music was being played all the time and then we also had some vinyl records with uh, mm. some of the uh, famous western compositions in the sense of classical western so for me when i grew up and, and realized that some of my classmates at school or in high school or later at the university were so far from our own music, let's say, and would only listen to pop music, and that would be uh, mostly under the influence of what was uh, uh, somehow custom made in the US. Uh, I was really shocked <laughs> because I, I had come from uh, a place which the, the surroundings were defined by Persian Kurdish music, Persian and Kurdish music with a touch of uh, exposure to other kind of music cultures. Uh, and I, I remember at that time that I felt kind of um, not not an alien, but in, in a minority uh, with whoever uh, I would share my passion. And I remember very uh, clearly the start of a very good friendship. I mean, she's still my best friend. When we were in, in, I was playing basketball in the university team and I was in, in a tournament. Uh, and then suddenly somebody was there uh, among the uh, people who were watching the games. And there was a sitar. And when I saw the sitar there with her, I was like, oh my God, take it away. It will break. And then she said, no, it's fine. I, I, I'm taking care of it. And then after the game, I asked her, who she learned with. And when she said, I learned with Hossein Ali Zadeh, I was like, oh my God, I have found someone. <laughs> and, and that was quite rare at that time. Uh, nowadays, there are a lot of more people playing sitar, playing the oud, playing all kinds of uh, Persian and, and Maram instruments. But at the same time, there are, in my opinion, there are not as deeply into it. They, they like playing the instrument, but they are not necessarily um, absorbing the inner content or, or that's what I've witnessed. So I think it has kind of developed in quantity, uh, but quality wise, it's still to be seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Salah. 
Well, for me, actually, it is it is um, it's not an easy uh, question to answer. Um, uh, I mean, I grew up also in an Arab country, uh, uh, learning what I thought to be uh, modal or makamic music, uh, let's say. But then um, uh, to discover later that actually uh, what we have learned uh, at music schools is. Uh, uh, is maybe a very, very tiny side of this, this, this very big world, let's say. Yeah. Um, basically concentrating on compositions, scales, and techniques, and uh, I mean, I mean uh, technique of, 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 of performing, let's say. Yeah. Uh, but um, I mean, I might actually, what Ross said, like uh, when you start looking beyond the boundaries of your own microcosm, uh, cosmos and uh, especially uh, run into into uh, into people from other backgrounds or uh, or even people who actually share your same cultural uh, uh, background but happen to live in in, in, in various uh, uh, regions um, uh, like people from from Iran people from Turkey people from Greece this actually widened uh, my horizon uh, uh, more and I discovered that actually there are more common things uh, uh, between us uh, uh, that are uh, very interesting to, to, to discover, uh, so to say. Um, uh, so as, as a musician, musician I, can, I can say that, uh, uh, I mean, the people I, I, I play with today, uh, the people I, I, I meet, they really have interest in, uh, in, in modern music, in, uh, in the maqam uh, music, so to say. Um, but um, as a performer, uh, I still feel that there is uh, 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 not so, so much recognition, let's say, um, uh, on the on the musical scene. Uh, so um, I mean, unfortunately, you cannot survive as a, a traditional um, uh, musician who's playing only his music who's uh, playing only traditional uh, modern music. Uh, there's, there's less interest, unfortunately, for, for this kind of music, uh, let's say, on, 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 uh, on the, global, uh, the global venues. Um, the minute you start to, to do crossover projects, to, 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 to meet uh, jazz musicians, uh, rock musicians recently, for example, uh, it gets interesting for for others, and then all, all of a sudden the doors uh, are are open for you. Um, so, I mean, as you see, it's a very ambiguous relationship, uh, so to say. Um, um, I mean, the other thing is that as 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 a researcher working on the music or studying the music of uh, of the region that I come from, so to say. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm usually called an ethnomusicologist, um, although I'm working on my own uh, musical culture as well as, I mean, as a historian, less than an, an, an ethnographer, but I'm still uh, seen as an ethnomusicologist. Um, so I, I'm defined rather, uh, uh, um, I mean, based on the, on the subject I'm, I'm studying, but not the methodology I'm, I'm, I'm using. Um, uh, I do sense actually a great interest from the students in just abandoning everything uh, classical. Uh, I mean, people seem to be fed up of, uh, uh, I mean, especially young students of only st um, studying the same uh, subjects, uh, having the same classes uh, on uh, classical music history, uh, Renaissance music, Baroque music, and so on. I mean, they want, they are eager to learn more about other music cultures, uh, my culture included. Uh, so I do sense this uh, um, uh, this interest. Uh, actually, I would like to return the question to Ross because he mentioned when well, he introduced himself something that actually we all know uh, as a as as um, I mean as the founder of this labyrinth uh, teaching platform, let's say, or or or. or um, uh, cultural encounters. Uh, let's say. I mean, what is his impression actually? I mean, because it started already um, many years ago, and where are we now? I mean, Ross, you are receiving students from all over the world. 
do you sense that people are getting more interested in uh, in, in, in this kind of, of music, especially uh, uh, young students from uh, from our um, uh, uh, I mean countries from, from our region? Well, yes, <laughs> actually. Um one thing which is of considerable interest to me is to cultivate more interest uh, well should i say not more interest because i think there's plenty already there more capability for students from uh, the eastern regions from turkey from iran from the arab world and from central asia to be able to come because one of the prime obstacles which gets in their way is the difficulty of obtaining visas on the one hand and also the financial dimension even though we do everything possible to keep all of the prices of, of our courses as low as possible, we chase the, the local and the central government for as much funding as possible so that we can subsidize students. Even still, for many of them, you know, just to, to leave their own country and come to a country like Greece is, is almost uh, insurmountable as a difficulty. If you take into account Iran, for example, with its present economic difficulties, uh, or even Turkey, uh, it's very difficult. So we're trying to find some way to maybe to sponsor a certain number of students and find some some person to, to do that. What I see is a lot of interest. What I also see in countries, especially like Turkey, Iran, many Arab countries, Greece also, is that there is a young generation which who are very, very open-minded. Um, they're rather fed up with these rather narrow nationalistic narratives of their own music, which have been, uh, they've been propagated over the last century, basically. Um, you know, we have that here in Greece also. You know, every, everything comes from ancient Greece. You know, you know, we created everything. And nobody believes this stuff anymore. And the same with, with Turkey, the same with Iran, the same with the Arab world. Um, we basically come from a region of the world here where we all we're all in countries with very very ancient names you know greece egypt syria uh, persia india but they're all younger than australia as national uh, as, as nation states and so each one is has created this narrative which sort of pumps it up sort of in a way and this has been as much of an obstacle in the past as anything else to young people taking an interest. And it's very nice to see that the young people are, they're just pushing this all aside now. And they're very much concerned with studying this music in the context, in the context of getting together with other people with similar interests, but of different backgrounds. But that I find to be something very, very positive. Yes, <laughs> Yerasim. Hello, Yerasim. How are you? How are you doing? Okay. Hello. How are you? Uh, nice hi. to meet you. All of you. Very, very, very well. Very well. Very well. Nice to meet you. Nice to On a side note, Negar, Negar, uh, next time you come to Hudetsi, I'm going to challenge you to a one-on-one -on -one game of basketball. Okay. So. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> that was eight ago, ago, Ross. I was, uh, yeah, I think for the last me, for, time I played it, ever. It was even more ages ago for me. <laughs> so don't worry. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> I take the challenge. I have to start practicing since, uh, I mean, me from too. tomorrow on. <laughs> <Me too. laughs> Great. So, uh, sorry sorry for my, my sick yeah. humor again. Sorry about that. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. Yeah. I, I wanted to to, uh, to pick something from what just uh, Ross said. Um, I, I see it as a. I mean, whenever ever, uh, somebody talks about globalization, in in the sense, uh, at least for some time, it looked as if globalization means uh, the West uh, is is conquering the whole world mm. with. with Mainly social media using as as, as a uh, as a tool or, or internet uh, in, in general, but uh, it can have also the other uh, effect. The other side of the story could be that people from different parts of the world find each other more easily, and then uh, it, it can also connect uh, individuals from different parts of the world that wouldn't have any chance to see each other's uh, activities and uh, listen to each other's music, and so. 
globalization on one side sounded negative, but on the other hand, it brought a lot of uh, constructive uh, relations, at least among individuals. Maybe it's not, uh, how to say, it, it's, it's not for all the people yet. Uh, I mean, somebody has to work on that to see how much um, rap music, for example, with all these beats and things have uh, taken the hearts and minds of the younger generation in Iran, for example. I, I had the experience that whenever I wanted to teach uh, the younger generation the, the stuff that they, I expected them to find as native uh, people of that music kind of perceivable, especially about intonation, it was so alien to their ears that they couldn't grasp that uh, what we call koron, the uh, half flat yeah. uh, interval. They really couldn't play it. After, after a whole uh, semester of playing cigar, it was still not sounding cigar. So uh, that I found a, a negative impact. But on, uh, at the same time, I can find somebody in, in Japan, for example, somebody's learning with me online from Japan, and he plays Sega so marvelously now after a couple of sessions that I, I just enjoy listening to him. So uh, I, I just wanted to say, uh, yeah, in, in uh, response to what just Ross said, uh, I think it, it's also nice to look at. Yeah. I will carry on over the, the idea of the impact of globalization over the local music. But before that, let's have a brief introduction of uh, Grasimus. Mm -hmm. Please introduce yourself. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Gerasimus Papadopoulos. I am a Greek uh, musician. And um, I'm specialized in uh, what we call Byzantine music. Uh, from you, I personally know only uh, Ross. And... Uh, um, so I, I'm focused on um, uh, neo, what we call neo-Byzantine music, which is the current Greek chant tradition, uh, let's say, which is um, in use today based on a very interesting notational system, neum, some particular neums. But I also play the wood. Uh, I uh, used to compose uh, modal music. Uh, I'm in all this, and I also do my PhD uh, this period uh, on Byzantine musicology, uh, combining ideas of linguistics with um, music, uh, which is my first uh, degree. Linguistics is my first bachelor. And um, that's it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Uh, Grasimus, we were talking about uh, the interest in Makam and model music uh, across your experience. Do you see people having more interest or uh, less interest than uh, expected? No, I'm sure that there is uh, more interest than the previous period. Um, yeah, and then and also in this in this um trend let's say um an interest for byzantine music the current neo byzantine music um has developed until some years uh, byzantine music was only for conservative religious people mm -hmm. today uh, we see uh, non religious people not necessary religious people um wanting to learn this music to um, uh, to learn its modality uh, the special techniques vocal techniques mm -hmm. yeah there is a, a growing interest of course interesting so yeah. uh, going forward with our discussion uh, uh, now we have seen maybe some uh, uh, background of uh, nagar's impression about globalization, positive and negative uh, impact. Uh, let me hear from the other guests. How do you see globalization effect on local music? Is a question to me? All of you. Ah, all Salah. Of you. Salah, I think it's your turn, yeah. Oh. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's again, uh, 
is a question with which we struggle actually in academia. Uh, I mean, globalization has uh, a good and a bad side. Uh, uh, I mean, to, to restrict myself to the best side of globalization is actually the fact that we are, are now together uh, on this uh, uh, on this on this panel uh, from different regions speaking about issues that all uh, that are that are of interest to, 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 to all of us. I mean, globalization connects people. Uh, it brings them brings them together, make us aware of different uh, cultures, different uh, uh, attitudes, different uh, procedures uh, uh, towards things that might interest uh, oneself. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, the role the mass media plays in globalization uh, does indeed have a very risky and uh, um, uh, side and with, with tremendous. Um, uh, uh, consequences for uh, for local musics for uh, for special kinds of, uh, of uh, um, traditional uh, uh, let's let's call it rural or even urban urban musical styles. Uh, I mean, because the media uh, does concentrate uh, ultimately on on uh, on the. Um, the widely mediated uh, music, which is uh, connected to, to to maximizing uh, profit. So at, at the end, the music that we that we we we, we get uh, into touch with um, through these channels is at the end is a product, is a commercial product, and uh, uh, and indeed uh, I see that this is uh, that this does endanger. Um, uh, other musics takes their their, 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 their place, uh, uh, so to say. Um, so I mean, again, uh, it's 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 uh, it has positive as well as as, as negative sides. Uh, but I'm 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 more optimistic about uh, about it, and I and I want to see the bright sides of uh, of globalization. Um, uh, I mean, as I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, and again, using the words of, of Ross, like looking beyond your own boundaries. Um, uh, I mean, with the with with the, with the internet, let's say, and uh, with this with this possibility, actually, um, uh, we can we can notice an uh, emergence of uh, of new of new styles. For example, in the Arab world, just to restrict myself to to, to my region. Uh, uh, I mean. Arabs did all the time appreciate, uh, for, so to say, like, um, Ottoman Turkish music. I mean, we grew up playing like Samais and Peshrevs and so on. But in the recent years, actually, uh, uh, through, um, let's call it, um, uh, um, uh, this, this, this medial uh, revolution, you know, um, uh, uh, I mean, we are more encountered with more music uh, 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 from Turkey. Um, we have access to, uh, to, to, to to videos, to to to, to, to recordings uh, more than, than than before. Everybody can from the I mean have the the, the, the possibility to to surf just using their uh, uh, their smartphones, their mobiles, and uh, and and have access to to, to, to music. So. This led to a kind of uh, what I recently started to call a, a Turkish, just uh, in, I mean, um, uh, as uh, as the, the, there's in, I mean, in Turkish music culture, there's this uh, uh, term, a terminus arabesque, which is everything that is, uh, let's say, um, um, uh, in a way. Um, uh, Ornamented like Arabic ornamented stuff. Like, exactly, ornamented like Arab stuff. Uh, so now we are witnessing something which I, as I said, call Turkish <laughs> in, 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 in the Arab world. I mean, we start to, 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 to import musical instruments from Turkey. I mean, for example, the, 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 the Qanun with the, with, the, with the higher number of, of mandals leading to a change of, te of, of, of playing technique, leading to a change of, uh, uh, um, of, of conceptualizing, of, 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 of the, the notion of, of, uh, of intervals even, even, even change. 
uh, was being used a long, for a long time to, to, to play kanuns with only four uh, uh, levers, I mean, mandalar or mandals. Uh, uh, now our musicians are playing uh, the kanun. We, we start to see many musicians playing the clarinet, which is which has been introduced to, to urban music culture in Turkey earlier than in the, in, the, in the Arab world. We start to see musicians play also in Turkish style. We start to see musicians actually um, uh, more eager to learn makams which have been neglected in, 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 in the Arab world. And that's all thanks to, to, to this, um, uh, to the, to the, to the um, to, let's call it, uh, to this bright side of globalization. Okay. Uh, is this going to diminish the local musics? Is this a risk for local musics? For example, the intervals, uh, the way we ornament, the way we sing. For example, singing and improvising, <laughs> doing taksims is, is maybe related to the syllables of the local language, right? Sometimes, or uh, other things, other aspect. factors. Yeah, I mean, with this kind of a globalization and, and being open to everything, uh, how do you see it, Rose? Well, let me just point out that uh, globalization is not something new. Um, I used to work in a multinational recording company, the BM, BMG, Bertelsmann, in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And I remember speaking with the, the director of the company, uh, the branch of the company in Athens. And uh, his contract uh, as the, the, the CEO of Bertelsmann in Greece allowed him to do productions of pop and rock and a limited amount of jazz in Greece, but it did not allow him to do productions of any traditional music of, of Greece itself. So he was allowed by contract to do productions of pop, rock and jazz, but not to do productions of local music in Greece. So this is, this is one aspect of globalization going back to the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, and this is one of the negative aspects, of course, which is this is uh, imposed culture from outside. However, another good example is uh, I can cite as our own musical workshop labyrinth, who we're in a village of 800 people in the middle of nowhere. And yet we're able to communicate with people from all over the world and bring teachers from all over the world. And, you know, this is one of the real benefits of this technology. So it really is a question of how you use it and, and things like that. There is a tendency, I mean, I'm on a little island called Crete, which is very small. It has a population of about 600,000 people. Uh, it's quite small, actually. There was a lot of regional variety of music on the island of Crete, actually, originally. I mean, from the west to the east of Crete, um, there was quite different music. Today, there is a sort of a pan-Cretan style of music. Uh, the, the local variety of has sort of uh, it's much less than it used to be. This is, whether we like it or not, the result of what you might call non-stoppable technology, um, that people are coming into contact with things. Uh, I know many people in the Arab world who are rather upset about this uh, increasing hegemony of Turkish sounds in the Arab world. Just as I know people in Turkey who are rather upset about the increasing hegemony of Arab sounds in Turkish music. And of course, people in Greece are a bit upset about sounds coming from both of them. So uh, this is something which happens. What I think has to happen, however, is there's a difference between copying somebody and being inspired by someone. And uh, I think that if you're inspired by what somebody else is doing, which is different from what you're doing, that's an opportunity for opening. Whereas if you're just copying for the sake of, you know, some commercial success or something like that, you know, well, if I, if I make it sound Arabic, it'll, it'll sell better. If I make it sound Turkish, it'll make me more popular. More girls will like me. Um, that's, that's not a very noble goal, actually. <laughs> so it's, it's a question of how you actually approach it. If it's something which genuinely inspires you, that, oh, I, you know, um, I, I'm really, I really feel inspired to this because I really love that sound and I, I find it to be very inspiring. I think that's going to lead you in the right direction um, or it's good to at least give you a chance of finding the right direction. 
Yeah. Whereas the other, I think, just leads you up a dead end. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, and and one I couldn't more agree thing more. <laughs> One more thing, I think uh, today we are recording more than it was in the in the uh, 18th century or uh, later, you know, with the limited technologies. Yes. Till today, we can go to a disc or a phonograph or a gramophone and we listen to a piece in anywhere of these countries, in the Macan places. And we could know their intervals, the way they ornament, the way they play their instruments. And also we can get inspired about it. So luckily the technology is preserving mm -hmm. these colors and, uh, and unique tastes of these things. So I really love the idea yes. of inspiration really. Uh, is there any other uh, comment on, on the same point? Uh, I would like to add something if I may. Yeah. Uh, it, it's in the yes, same direction, yeah. but it may be put into a different uh, kind of wording uh, i also wanted to say that uh, motivation of the people who uh, is is very important like uh, well ross put it in a different way that uh, if i do it more turkish i will win more hearts or whatever <laughs> or more likes uh, I, I know a lot of musicians who are working in their own culture with the same goals of course yes and uh, I know a lot of musicians who are playing an instrument, partly copying, partly pushing it forward, but still they are more focused on the uh, what they call technique, but I don't use that word in that sense. I think they are more doing mechanical things on their instruments to, uh, yeah. or call it acrobatics or whatever you like. But uh, altogether, if we want to um, increase the inspiration, uh, possibilities. Uh, I think we, we all, or at least that's my wish, if we could uh, get better and better with the quality of sound production uh, ourselves and in the recordings, because I think what we miss a bit on, on the technology, I mean, the modern technologies uh, have brought a different ideals to people's uh, expectations let's say uh, today if if you watch a movie with a rather mediocre video quality you, you will just stop after half an hour unless the subject is so thrilling that you can't stop uh, because a lot of movies a lot a lot of video stuff has been produced with just high quality pictures and I think a lot of not so good music is being produced all over the world with good sound, while the modal music is not being produced with that much of uh, high quality sound. So uh, if, if I wanted to increase the possibility of in, uh, inspiration with uh, other uh, musicians' works, I would, I would really hope for better quality of sound recording. Mm -hmm. That's a good point, yes. Ah. I would like to add, to add something. Uh, last uh, maybe five years, I, I took a lot of interviews with chanders, not, not only from Greece, but from around the world. And uh, I was very, um, let's say, uh, shocked because I see that in current situation, the current situation of chanting is exactly the opposite of what we expect um because of globalization so what i see is a let's say conservatism neoconservatism if we see the past uh, years from 19th century until the late tw uh, 20th century uh, we see that there are a lot of tendencies in composing and in the chantic styles a lot of tendencies inspired of different styles so we have some tendencies going through to uh, Western music. Uh, we have a, 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 a harmonizations of, uh, of altered chants. And on the other side, we have new compositions uh, using macams, using ornaments of um, mostly uh, inspired by uh, from Turkish uh, singers and so on. So this is two centuries ago. Today, last... 20 or 10 years, we see uh, a neoclassicism, let's, let's say, a conservatism. 
And I, I feel that it's mm. because of globalization, because of this, um, Chanders are trying to find themselves, to find their identity and be separated and um, be distinct. Um, and so uh, in terms of, uh, let's say, the composing, okay, we see very, very uh, simple compositions, not simple in the way of uh, simplicity, but simple in a, in a very cl classical, or following classical phrases that are traditional and are uh, transcribed in the 19th century. And they are trying to imitate very old forms of uh, compositions uh, and avoiding uh, inspiration. So mm -hmm. they are trying to find a, a pure Byzantine style, let's say, in order to uh, distinct them from Turkish music, from Western music. And so this is an, let's say, an opposite effect of globalization, which is very mm -hmm. interesting, I think. Mm -hmm. And on, on the other hand, we see that in terms of uh, interpretation of how they sing, uh, uh, subconsciously, uh, they are trying to find a common style instead of a lot of different styles and local styles. They are trying to find a common style and avoiding to uh, to do this noise, uh, nosal uh, interpretation who, that was very, very um, usual in uh, 19th century and so on. So they are trying to clear their sound um, and make it clearer and, and, uh, in... in um, closer to the sound of uh, a Western singer, but not actually uh, with this um, operative, let's say, and uh, a tenor voice of uh, like Pavarotti and so on, but a clear, clearer voice. So they follow this tendency of current uh, last years, but in terms of composition, they are trying to find themselves uh, differentiating themselves to the others, mm -hmm. to the to the relatives, to the Turkish or the Arabs. Yeah, that's my impression. Yeah, actually the impression mm -hmm. about globalization is like uh, more complex than having it two-sided. <laughs> yeah, it seems so. Yeah. Well, it does force certain people into what you would call a defensive position, which is, I think, what Gerasmus is describing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, which, yeah, the, it's understandable why it happens, but it's not really very beneficial for the tradition itself, no. Because it, uh, yeah, as I you feel said, it, it, it's like, that's the last thing you should do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. So what did... Uh, time till about the repertoire versus, versus the making of mu new music? What I see is, uh, well, uh, here in, uh, in Greece, uh, let's take this example, um, up until the late 1970s, I would say, uh, the young people of the country showed very, very little interest, if any, in what you would broadly refer to as traditional music. One of the reasons for that was that tr traditional music here was very much promoted by and exploited by a very ugly military government, which we had here between 1967 and 1974. And they would sort of use tradition and traditional music and you know, all these traditional values to support basically what was nothing more than nothing less than fascism anyway. Mm -hmm. So the connotation for tradition here was very ugly for young people in those years. And it was through the efforts of a very small number of people uh, following those years that an interest in tradition actually did return basically through the medium of, of Rebetigo songs, which um, that was something which could not be identified with an extreme conservatism because uh, it was basically music of an underclass. So, and out of the interest for Byzantine music came an interest in other aspects of traditional music. Uh, the connection, of course, between Repetico and the music of Asia Minor started to become very obvious. 
and that the connection between that and Byzantine chant also uh, very much as Gerasim was described. So an, in, an increase in interest did develop out of all of that. Um, and it led to a, a later time in which all of this music suddenly became of interest. But uh, it was not necessarily out of an interest for the music per se, more, more than it was out of interest for what the music symbolized in a way. And so it became a, an object of identification for people. Mm -hmm. And this was a bit restrictive because it meant that uh, people were not treating what you might refer to as traditional music as a creative art. Mm -hmm. um, here in, in Greece, at any rate, traditional music has always been associated with exclusively with entertainment. It unfortunately does not have a dimension such as that in Turkey or Iran or the Arab world where you have um, a rather sort of you have the entertainment music and you also have a very you can also have religious music with instruments for example which is not possible in greece uh, or you can also have uh, you know the, there were the court musical traditions which survived and became you know so the the urban musical traditions of the educated classes yeah uh, this did not happen here so music was associated exclusively with with entertainment basically which also led to it being associated with rather dubious moral qualities. Uh, and this has also been a problem as well. Uh, it's extremely, it was up until recently, and in many cases still is, it was extremely undesirable for the son or daughter of a good family to become a musician. This would be a disgrace. Um, musicians were seen as little different to prostitutes, basically, in many cases. So uh, this is this has happened in other countries as well. So basically, what we refer to as musical tradition has, in a way, uh, on the one hand, it's been elevated on a pedestal as being something of great value. This is our identity. This is what my grandfather did. You know. On the other hand, um, this is something to be ashamed of, and this is something which is an embarrassment because. It is something which is associated with lesser morality. So the interesting thing is that within recent decades, music and local music, which is basically what traditional music is, is breaking out of these barriers gradually and gradually reclaiming its position as an art form. Mm -hmm. So that means that instead of just being copying the past as tradition, because I mean, what is tradition? Tradition is not about the past. Tradition is that which is timeless, that which is equally relevant to the past, the present and the future. Uh, and that which spans over such a, a huge stretch of time, reaffirming its own value as it goes. Um, so that's something which I think there's more people who are looking into that aspect of tradition rather than just repeated habit. Because there is that aspect of tradition as well. I mean, it's traditional to beat your wife, but it's not a very good thing to do. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to say tradition, then we have to look at tradition in its full sense. You know? <laughs> it's not just that beautiful song you heard the other day. It's also... <laughs> You know, and so we have to we have to make distinctions. So what are the things there which are genuinely positive values and genuinely of timeless value, and not just habits which get repeated over and over again uh, out of familiarity? So that that's where the whole aspect of tradition cannot just be about copying the past. It must also be equally about uh, contemporary creation and having something to propose to the future. So uh, that's something which I see gradually gaining ground uh, here in Greece and also in other countries I see that as well. Of course, not all of these attempts at becoming creative within a traditional context are successful, uh, but they never were in the first place. I mean, in other ages also, they were never all successful. What we see now is that which was uh, uh, 
distilled from the total creation which comes from the past. We don't see the whole thing. Many things have fallen by the wayside. They just didn't have the the uh, the impetus to go forward in time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's a lot of stuff coming out today which is not so good. Uh, but there's a lot of attempts of people to do something. And out of all of that effort, something good will come. Interesting. Interesting. So how do you see it, uh, Megar? Uh, I, I wanted to say it's it's Salah's time, but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I, I was still thinking about the tradition of beating one's wife. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just uh, but but it was very well very well put. I mean that point of how to see tradition, I think, is the key to understanding uh, the idea of <laughs> the idea of. I mean, I, I always compare when I want to teach uh, the basic idea of maram uh, or, or any stuff like in in parts of Daska as well. I always say that you could you could see it like cooking. Uh, when I get the recipe from a grandmother, uh, what she used to cook, it, it might be uh, that I don't even have the same ingredients anymore. It might be that I don't yeah, yeah. want to have exactly the same taste anymore. But I have learned how she or, or whoever in the past was, was making a dish. And I, I can make it my own way. Uh, and it's a continuation of that kind of uh, dealing with food uh, over generations. And of course, I can someday wake up and have uh, a weird idea of putting something together, which is supposed to be a new dish. But the uh, possibility of making something out of it, which is really eatable, is <laughs> usually not high. And, and the, you, you can easily end up making something which you will not enjoy eating. I mean, uh, I've experienced that, <laughs> yeah, both in music and cooking. But uh, um, I, I think what would really, uh, before I, I say the last thing, I wanted to say that what Ross was saying was, again, very interesting for me, because uh, with what happened in Iran, I can see the same things happening, even parallel. Like in, in some... Uh, decades uh, it was exactly the same like some families wouldn't even think of their children going to learn music because they thought it was really uh, a bad thing to do morally wrong i even had the experience myself that then when i was carrying my oud uh, taking a taxi in tehran to go from uh, a studio home uh, then the taxi driver would ask me questions which were kind of hints that I, I could read between the lines as if I would do other things to entertain people, <laughs> in a sense. And uh, it, th that was really uh, insulting, of course, but I could also perceive what that part of the society was thinking of a female musician. And uh, because for him, it was just a woman with an instrument, right? There was no other uh, context to it. But at the same time, there were some other families who would only uh, encourage their children to play traditional music, which at that time would mean Daska music, classical Daska music. There were some families who would allow that, but would forbid anything in pop or rock or whatever they would consider coming from uh, the, the devil, the evil West. And then at the same time, there were families who would allow their, their children only to play the piano because they <laughs> considered that to be kind of stylish and from the new era. And so at the same time, all these were living uh, parallel to one another. And it's interesting to see how uh, crazy <laughs> it might get. Uh, and I, I guess that the whole world is also experiencing the same thing. Uh, like all these things are going parallel. Uh, it's only getting, I mean, it's only showing its craziness when you open something like Instagram and you just roll up and you see all of those things one after another and then it make, it gets out of sense. Uh, but about the repertoire and the, uh, the new composition, uh, we have had maybe around the same time, maybe a bit uh, later uh, in Iran, as you know, or, uh, there was a tendency to um, 
arrange melodies and themes from all over the country, from different regions, into a context that they, they had named as orchestra, like, like national orchestra or whatever. And then there came a wave or a movement to replace that with uh, something that would be only with the old instruments, which means santur, tar, setar, oud, uh, kamonche, and so on. There, there was even the fight over the violin, you know better than anyone, I guess. Father. And uh, now it, it's again going parallel. And composing for each and every one of those, uh, are, again, the same as Ross uh, explained, are happening a lot. But what remains out of it later would be the question. Sorry if I talked a bit too long. Interesting. Uh, Salah? Well, I mean, um, I mean, it's again, actually, we, 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 we should consider ourselves lucky that we are living in, 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 in this time uh, where uh, every and each one, every and each individual actually can develop their own tastes and their own um, uh, uh, interests, uh, which, uh, which was not possible, I mean, if we look decades um, uh, back. Uh, people used to listen to the same music they were encountered to or bombarded with, I mean, through the, uh, first, let's say, the media, or, 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 or even before that, the, 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 the phonograms, or even before that, I mean, it's, it's, it's the it's same the music culture that people were encountered to, I mean, uh, to. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, nowadays, actually, the individual, uh, every individual actually has the opportunity to, to, to choose um, uh, what is suitable uh, for them. Um, uh, I mean, so we are, in, in a way, are actually, uh, we, we all became, if we want or not, actually intercultural global uh, citizens. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, for example, if I want to speak about my own, I mean, my own interests or tastes, um, just because I'm working as a musicologist, actually, I have to listen to as much music as possible, and I have to be open to to every kind of uh, of music and to think critically of these uh, uh, of these musics. Um, but at the end of the day, when I go home, if I want to have, uh, I mean, uh, a fulfillment, okay, I honestly listen to a, a Greek uh, chanter. A Byzantine chanter uh, reciting alone, or a Quran reciter, or I listen only to a Kemenja taksim, or a Kanun taksim from from an old master. This is like the thing that which makes me which makes me happy, which in, in induces the tarab, let's say, feeling in uh, um, uh, in me. Um, uh, so, um, as I said, I mean, it is it is. Uh, Today, it's up to everyone to choose uh, what's uh, what's suitable for them. So even the, the term tradition um, has to be redefined. Uh, what is tradition today? I mean, what is traditional? What is what is left of tradition? I mean, this what we call tradition is exactly what we have uh, inherited from the generations before us. And what we, for example, now call the classical Arab music is actually, uh, it's, it's a term that we coined ourselves, actually, because for, for people, I mean, centuries ago, they, were, they, they just know the term music or whatever term in their language is actually stood for that, for, for this phenomenon, music. Um, so they did not know uh, Arab music, Turkish music, Persian music. For them, it was, it was uh, music and that's it. The minute we, we got encountered with, for example, Western music, that's where you start to find in the, um, in the literature, for example, um, uh, that, that, these, that the new coined terms, Western music uh, versus uh, Eastern music, and then uh, uh, Arabic music, Arab music versus Turkish music versus, versus Persian music. And then Egyptian music versus Syrian music, and and so on. And what do we have now? We have now single musics actually of, of of people of musicians. So it is like my music versus his music versus her music, um, uh, because he or she or I like we, we, we are uniting 
possibly more traditions and more cultures in our uh, uh, in our music. And so I cannot, for example, say that what I play is purely in, in uh, genuinely Arab uh, uh, music. And uh, how how long can I can I trace that music back? Actually, as I said. Um, uh, the, the minute uh, we started to have recordings, say at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, that music recording back then, this served a long time as a model for the, uh, let's say, for the classical music that should be um, imitated or looked upon as the, uh, uh, the good music, so to say. Um, it's funny, it's just, just the other day, for example, I was reading um, a passage from uh, the, the book of Kamil uh, Khulai, the Kitab al Musiqi al Sharqi, the Eastern Book of Music, um, where he actually is um, uh, complaining about the musicians of his time. So we're speaking about 1906, 1904. He was complaining about the musicians of his time that they keep composing music in Maqam Saba and Bayati and that it's getting so uh, uh, annoying and this is like, uh, uh, I mean, it's time to move on. It's time to start composing music in Kurdi and Hijaz Kar Kurdi and in, uh, in Nihaven, which were, by the way, newly introduced maqams in Turkey, in, in Egypt uh, uh, back then. At least this is what the literature tells us. Um, so now we hear actually, <laughs> I mean, uh, people, uh, saying that please stop composing in, in Kurdili Hijazkar, please stop composing in Nihaven, these maqams are getting on, on, on our nerves, get back to Saba, get back to Bayati, get back to Huzam, which is a very interesting, um, it's a very interesting phenomenon actually, we are recreating, re, um, um, I mean, recreating tradition, uh, so, so, so to say, um, of course, uh, I mean, it is easier to compose a song in, in the Havend and, uh, and, uh, and have the maximum dissemination uh, because you can add harmony to that, you can use Western instruments, it's easier to, to, to perform that, uh, I mean, the song in the Havend, for example, on Western instruments uh, with polyphonic passages or whatsoever. Uh, the real, the real, um, uh, um, uh, uh, struggle or uh, um, uh, I mean the, 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 the hardest task would be actually to compose something in Makam Saba and maybe maybe let's say uh, dare to add harmony to that I mean this is this is this is something that we don't uh, um, uh, have uh, or, 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 or or I mean we don't hear a, a lot of these um, uh, things and when harmony is added it's always added in the western sense of, of I mean, understanding harmony in the western sense yeah. so i mean if we are i mean we have to deal with the uh, western uh, music uh, heritage which is a great heritage uh, and we want to learn and to add something from that music okay there is a way maybe to to to, to enter harmony for example i mean uh, people could 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 try to do that in in, in a way that actually goes well together with the own um, uh, with the own tradition. Um, yes, I mean, um, I don't know, I'm, uh, I took also so long now, so maybe I can uh, throw the ball at uh, Erasmus. Erasmus, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking now about the this conflict, I think is a conflict that is um, very common in all the the other countries uh, the, of the East, there is a conflict in uh, in Greece, and uh, this is a conflict that uh, started since the first in the early years of the uh, Greek Republic. A conflict between the West and the East, and um, always we have this feeling that West is better and uh, for the higher class, and the uh, East is there is a guilt behind everything that is. East. And because of this uh, conflict, um, a lot of things are interpreted, uh, interpreted through this uh, spectrum. Anyway, I will go to the new generation, our generation today. Um, and I, I feel that 
this generation last 30 years, uh, we have some musicians that know very well the Macam system, the world of the world of the uh, East music, let's say. And this is something new. Yeah. Until uh, before this uh, 20, 30 years, good musicians, let's say good musicians, were familiar only uh, with West music. So the Eastern music, let's say, um, was connected to the the Rebetico to the Laiko, which is the folk music and the evolution of Rebetico. And um, also you, you had to go to uh, very uh, dark places uh, in order to listen to uh, a, a violinist playing a la turca, playing uh, taksims. Um, so this today changed. So we have a lot of new mus of musicians, new generations, in duration, uh, knowing very well Macams. And uh, I think that is today, I, I feel that we are in this um, uh, threshold, this uh, line, we have to uh, go, go beyond, beyond this, that we overthink today. I feel that uh, a new generation of composers overthink uh, because they are trying to um, to apply all this knowledge on the compositions and so they make very complex compositions very secular very um, let's say um, yeah very complicated and I don't feel this um, this naturality and this simplicity that we find in the folk music the traditional music where composers uh, just um, just develop the melody without overthinking, mm -hmm. and uh, so for me the the new the new generation have to find himself uh, them, themselves and um, find this simplicity in order to make uh, Eastern music, let's say influenced by Easter and based on this knowledge but in order to uh, follow this tradition of uh, simple folk songs mm -hmm. so I, I think that this is what is missing today this is what um, we have to find and uh, because of this old situation we see very complex Easter uh, melodies, let's say, and very trash. <laughs> okay, uh, that follow these old tendencies of uh, what we say skilladico uh, in in Greek. And I know very, very well, very good musicians that know everything, know macams, know everything, they play very good taxims. But the only place that they can earn money is places of trash music. So we have to, we have to find this middle um, uh, to to find ourselves in the middle mm -hmm. and produce music for the people for masses, but good music for the people. That that are my thoughts. Uh, interesting. May, may I add maybe some tiny remarks? Um, uh, I I think. I mean, from what I've seen in the, I mean, which is which is which is basically the the problem of, uh, of 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 the people in our region since let's call that colonization or the the the, um, uh, the encounter with the with the uh, more powerful, I mean, West at, at that time and still <laughs> powerful West. Um, uh, it's it's the struggle actually of identity. Uh, I mean, we adopted the idea, for example, of uh, of teaching music in conservatories, in music schools, uh, in higher institutions of music, and we adopted also the way of teaching music from from uh, from the West. Uh, so, in a way, we abandoned actually this traditional method of of teaching, which I mean, in in a wider 
uh, Ottoman context, we call it Meshk. I'm sure that there are um, designations in, in, in every and each language, in Arabic and in, in Greek and so on, but let's see, take the Ottoman uh, terminus uh, Meshk. Um, I mean, we, since we abandoned that, I cannot really speak of, 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 of pertaining or, or, or keeping a tradition, a tradition alive. Um, just to give maybe uh, some, some examples. Um, uh, I mean, we, or, or myself, I learned in a, in a, in a conservatory where we, where we had to learn, for example, maqams from textbooks. And maqams were demonstrated as scales. I mean, the problem is known to everybody. Um, uh, uh, and that would, of course, I mean, a very clever qu student would directly, po I mean, pose that the question, but, but excuse me, what's the difference between Shadi Arban, Suzy Dil, Sheikh Naz, and uh, let's say Hijaz Kar? Because the intervals are the same, the only thing is that it is just uh, transposed to a new degree. Uh, and teachers would actually be speechless at this at, at, I mean uh, when they are encountered with this uh, with this question exactly what is the what is the what is the difference between them that's because we start to we started to to, to conceive of, 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 of maqams or of modes as scales as a, as a, a series of intervals uh, of course if we think like that we will uh, we will fall into that trap uh, but I mean, we all know that it's not the case. That we all know that these maqams are different. They have different series. They have actually different intervals in a, 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 in a way or another. So the best way to to learn these is by learning the compositions, to learning the repertoire composed in these maqams. The best way to, to to learn this is by having a teacher singing for you the maqam and you imitating the way they are doing. That's when you learn this tradition. If you want to, to, to build on that tradition, then and invent, maybe invent your own maqam or your own sayir and then do something else, that's, that's, that's of course, I mean, this should be possible. We should not be, um, I mean, closed-minded. This, this, but if you want to learn the, the, the tradition and then uh, and say that you know the, the maqam or the moral system, this is actually the way it was taught and this is the way it should be, it should be taught. So in the Arab world today, uh, not even today, I mean, even if you go back 200 years uh, earlier, we find, for example, people who were differentiating, I mean, who were really distinguishing between, uh, between maqams which are very close from our point of view today. So, for example, uh, the, the song collector, Shihab al yeah. uh, uh, Hijazi, in his song text collection, he, he had, a, I mean, uh, um, a suite, a nauba, or let's call it a fasl, um, uh, for pieces in Maqam Bayati, in Maqam Nairiz, in Maqam Arasbar. The same pieces, the same vocal pieces are found at the beginning of the 20th century in another song text collection, all attributed to Maqam Bayati. Mm. So the question is, why is somebody who is writing uh, 60 or 50 years earlier actually distinguishing between these Maqams and somebody later attributing the same pieces to the same, to the same Maqam? Uh, today we have the same problem that people would say I'm playing a taksim on 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 on, on Bayati, but the piece following is actually in Husseini, so to say, um, uh, or the or the or the song following is in Muhayyir, but the taksim is in Ushak. Um, so you see that people are starting mixing these uh, these things without actually, um, um, I mean, they're not building on a solid basis. Uh, so now, actually, what I would call for is indeed just to, to put aside this Western idea of, uh, of, uh, of music education. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's, if, wanna, if you want to have a department to learn musical notation and harmony and whatever and all these things, this is fine. I mean, I, I am, um, I'm, I'm fine with that. But at least we should have institutions who, which teach music uh, the way the music is actually, or should be, should be, should be taught. Um, it should be a master. It should be masters, maybe not only one. And uh, music should be learned um, uh, uh, that way. This is the, this is what, what I believe. And of course, then at least this is something that we could uh, um, uh, now. I mean, uh, call um, a, a common, a common, a common tradition. Um, uh, as I said, now we have no boundaries anymore, so I can actually, I have more common things with Turkish music, with Persian music, 
I mean, they are all actually, they, they are, in a way or another, they are all, I mean, they have, we have an entangled history, let's say, and we look, I mean, back to the same, uh, to the same treatises, to the same scholars writing on this music. Um, uh, the musical exchange, as Ross said, globalization is not a new phenomenon. Actually, it's not only the 80s, it's even before, if you want to uh, um, uh, be more, um, uh, I mean, um, specific about it. Uh, musical exchange uh, was, I mean, we had musical exchange throughout the, 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 the centuries. The centuries. Uh, what, pe for example, people don't uh, acknowledge or know, um, just taking, for example, one, um, one encyclopedia on music, for example, by Yilmaz Ustuna. Um, you see him, for example, giving the biographies of, uh, of musicians serving at the court, the Ottoman court. Uh, he starts almost every entry with Turk Bistikari, which means a Turkish musician. But then he says, uh, Ermeni Asil or something, which of, of Armenian origin, of Greek origin, of Arab origin. So actually all these ethnicities, all these uh, people with different religious backgrounds, they, were, they all contributed to the same musical culture. Uh, Armenian chanters, Greek chanters, uh, um, I mean, the whole, uh, let's say, court uh, um, culture is based on um, uh, on, on, on Persian, uh, uh, Timurid, um, uh, model, uh, let's say, and in every in every uh, uh, invasion of of Iraq or something, musicians were 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 taken back to the to the Ottoman court, uh, either as captives or or on their own will. Uh, and music thrived in the in, in the courts, maybe less in the in the in the I mean more in the center, less in the per, in the periphery. But at the end, actually, the music was uh, um, it's the, I mean appreciated by 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 everyone, and everyone contributed to that common to that uh, common culture. And of course, today you go to northern Syria, you hear the same music the, the same music that you would expect in southern Turkey. If you if you go to eastern uh, to eastern Iran, you would have the same music that you you. you so sorry, to Western Iran, you have the same music that you hear in Eastern Iraq. Uh, the Iraqi maqam is so much connected with, uh, with, uh, with the Radif and the Dasgah system. So, I mean, um, we have more in common. It's better to, to learn from each other. It's better to, to, to maybe incorporate Persian elements, Turkish elements, and then maybe look beyond that to the, um, to the West. So, I mean... Uh, um, uh, Rose, I think you have some comment. Uh, yes, uh, I found what uh, what Geras Gerasimus and uh, Salah were saying was very interesting. Yes, yeah. um, about the fact that the way this music is is taught and the fact that it the way that it's taught does not actually lead to contemporary composition, which is of the same quality and depth as some of the older material. It is largely a result of this educational process you know there is one aspect uh, you know what we refer to as either traditional music or makam or modal music it has to survive in a world today where it has to compete with various other uh, types of music which for the hearts of the young people uh, and but there's a significant difference in the time scale which is necessary for the one and the other type of music if you're a pop singer, your career is basically over when you're 25. But within the type of music which we concern ourselves with, there is no such thing as a master younger than 40. It just can't happen because there's so much that you have to learn. And not just learn, but digest. And that's, that's the, the operative word for me. So, of course, we all know that makams are not scales. Uh, this is something which, unfortunately, in the Arab theory books and the Turkish theory books, they have overemphasized this far too much, the fact this whole sort of scale aspect of Makams. I think the Iranian tradition has been far more successful in treating that issue with the Radif because the Radif makes it very, very clear that the gushes and things, that these are phrase, this is phrase material. It's not, you, you can't reduce it to a similar, just to a scale. Mm -hmm. So I think that, um, you know, I, as it, as it happens, the last three years I've been studying Radif, and uh, I found uh, this extremely helpful 
in understanding Makam much better, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I was already familiar with the fact that, no, that, you, know, you learn Makam through this meshk process, which uh, Salah described very well. Uh, this is very important. You have the same thing in India with talim, they call it, which is the process of, of learning bit by bit these little phrases and, and putting the whole thing together. It's a process which takes a very long time. And um, this is something which makes it a bit difficult for people today because, you know, there are not that many young people who are prepared to sort of go through this very long journey. So this is music for actually for people who enjoy the long journey. And... Um, and who appreciate the journey as much as the destination. But our society today teaches us all to want to get quickly to the destination. Mm -hmm. And this is something which uh, is, is going to impede the, uh, the, pro the progress of this particular type of music. Mm -hmm. But I think that uh, where composition is concerned, another thing which happens is that you're quite often told by music teachers that, look, don't try and compose something. Learn your instrument first. This is completely wrong. Uh, if you are interested in composition, if you have the creative spark in you and you want to make it, from the very first day you pick up an instrument, do, try. It doesn't matter if you're not successful. Um, I, I remember I had one student uh, many years ago, and you know, in the very beginning, of, he was in his early stages, and... Uh, he would bring me every week of bringing me his, his newest composition. I remember looking at it and, you know, thinking to myself, this is dreadful. Yeah. And um, next week he came back with a new composition. And I'd look at it, oh, this is even worse. And uh, then he'd, it went on like this for a while, but I would encourage him. So, yes, you're doing okay. Keep going. Yeah. And one day he came with a composition. I looked at it. I thought, oh, I wish I'd written that. <laughs> and it just kept, started getting better and better and better. Uh, and, you know, today he's one of my favorite composers. Um, and so it's something which you have to get it get it going from the very, very first day that you pick up an instrument. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you have to take time digesting all of this material. That's very, very important. Mm. Um, it's not just a question of academically learning something. Uh, you have to You have to go through that process. Of course, you then have to sort of give it a chance to settle inside yourself and become something which you use without thinking about it. Uh, and that's, that's not an easy thing to do. That's what takes time. Uh, so that's exactly what Gerasimus was saying about the, the, the compositions of the older times. These were from people who didn't actually think about it. And also, you know, music is not, uh, it's not just theory or things like that. I remember we had here on Crete, we had a, um, I had a friend in Hanya, uh, a young lira player who was very skilled and very knowledgeable and everything like that, and very virtuoso and everything, played really well. And he had an uncle in the village, uh, and his uncle was not particularly brilliant. Uh, he was a carpenter, basically, he had because he used power tools, certain little bits of fingers missing and that sort of stuff. And anyway, so this younger one said to his uncle, you know, look, you know, but the uncle did do one thing really. Every time he'd pick up the instrument, he'd come up with something new and something new would come out. And um, so that the young one said, look, you know, I, I've learned the whole repertoire and I've learned all this theory and I've learned, but that what you do, you know, you, every time you pick up the instrument, something new comes out. I, I can't do that. Uh, what, how do you do that? And he, the uncle said, it's easy. You take a plastic bag, you go out into the countryside and you collect bees in the plastic bag and you put it next to your ear and you move it like that and you hear, you hear music inside, yeah. So this was a bona fide traditional musician whose prime tool for composition was a plastic bag. So this, this cuts through ideology, this cuts through correctness, this cuts through all of this sort of stuff. It's, people have to find something which inspires them and something, something which they've digested, something which is there, something which they can say, you know, this is my music. And then some way to sort of trigger that to come out in a, in a natural way and in a, in a creative way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. I like the idea you, you just gave a hint for, uh, Rose, which is knowing the thing theoretically or as a concept versus digesting. Yes. It, it's way beyond translating it in, into a piece of paper or maybe a line of speech oh, yes. or yeah, a concept yeah. or an idea. Yeah. I don't yeah. know how books has influenced us. As you said once, uh, Nagar, we worship books. 
right? This is really dangerous, and uh, this is not the way we learn anything. Cooking, any skill, you know, any, any skill, engineering, mathematics, it's way beyond paper and, and, and ideas uh, carried over uh, from one mouth to another. Well, it's interesting, you know, um, the only, uh, I suppose, the, the only culture in the world which did actually develop a, a fully, well, uh, to the best of our ability, a fully accurate system of writing music is probably the Western culture, mm. not because they were better than anyone else, no, out of necessity. Mm. Uh, it was a result of polyphony because of the orchestra. I mean, if you have more than seven or eight people playing together and they're not pretty disciplined, it's going to be really ugly. In the Eastern world, <clears throat> there has always been writing, uh, going back a very, very long way, but nobody ever thought you're going to learn a piece of music from a piece of paper. Yeah. It was always taken for granted that you're going to learn a piece of music from a person, but what yeah. you have on the paper is maybe just an, a, an aid to your memory, so you don't yeah. forget it. Yeah. So the, the system of writing never was particularly, it was sort of shorthand, like, like a secretary uses. Yeah. And what was necessary was that you had to actually learn a lot of stuff and digest it and, and remember it, and so be able to draw on it at any given moment. Um, and uh, this to me is a very, very valuable asset and something which the whole sort of bookish approach to learning has not been helpful. I mean, uh, if we go to Turkey as an example, I, I remember old musicians in Turkey. I remember people like uh, Kani Karaja and people like that who remembered literally thousands of people, pieces by memory, yeah. literally thousands. Um, today, you know, you get a lot of young players, and if you take the score away from them, uh, uh, th th they're lost. Yeah. yeah, this is this is not a good thing. Yeah. Um, uh, it's not just in Turkey either; it happens in many cultures. Uh, it's very valuable to be able to have, you know, to be what you might call musically literate, but there's a limit to the value of that, yeah. um, and you have to know how to use it and how not to use it. So it's it's very very important that people cultivate their their memory, their ability to improvise, and the ability to react to the moment, and all of these things are extremely important for this type of music. And this requires a long process of digesting a lot of material down to a level deep enough so that you can bring up things from there without having to think about it. Yeah. Interesting. I think we we partially hit into uh, the question of what did time till about the effective process of learning. So uh, I, I would like to hear from you uh, all about uh, your experience with the effective learning process, uh, maybe additions to what we have said previously. Who's going to start? Negar, I think it's your turn. <laughs> I, I thought I had taken too long in previous turn that I'm, I'm going no, to. No, <laughs> no. Uh, I, I wanted to, to um, say first that I think the idea of learning uh, is something we have to kind of elaborate on for anybody who wants to, to learn now, because it has become a bit uh, like, um, I mean, with the, with the technology these days and with the um, access everybody has to information, uh, I think that the idea of knowing something has changed. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people think of knowing e uh, as, as if it's equal to learning in the first place. They think uh, about collecting information. Uh, so even with the Radif stuff, for example, when they learn Daska, they think memorizing uh, the Radif of one uh, master is okay, then I know the Dasko stuff. Then even better if I memorize two radifs or, or even more. But I always bring in the question of, okay, so I can also give it to the memory of a computer. Do I, do I take it that the computer has learned it in, in a way that you want to uh, use it as a musician, whatever usage you might define for that? So I think it's important to think of what we call learning so that we, we can revisit the idea of the process and then what we what we want as digested learning will, will become more clear in in the older generations i think for example the 
the, the teacher I learned with, Mansur Nariman uh, on the Oud, he was always considering the learner individually. Like, like he would lead each and every learner on, on the path according to something he had in mind, which we were not uh, informed about. But he knew somehow th what this particular person needs in this particular moment as a piece, as a, as a, a exercise, an etude or whatever, or a song. Or if he recognized some, some special thing in someone, he would even get out of his whole stuff either on paper or in, in memory or whatever. And he would just start, for example, playing a, a, a paille, which we call in, in Persian music for a rhythmic pattern. He would start playing that and then tell the, the learner to just play something, whatever, mm -hmm. just a single note and keep going. And then you would feel as if somebody is pushing you into uh, the deep parts of a swimming pool. But then you would, you would somehow manage and that would give you a very positive feedback into the next step. It might have been, I don't know, but it might have been exactly the same as Ross explained about that learner that the first writings were awful. I don't know if Nadimon was thinking that my first attempts on, on improvisation was awful or not, but he kept encouraging me. And, and the next time and the next time. And then after some time, he would even ha have a slight hint of smile wh while listening to what was happening, not just to me, with every uh, learner there at, at his place. Uh, so I think he had a very clear idea of what learning was about. And he had a clear idea of what his role as a, a teacher in the process of learning happening within the, the world of the learner, not in, in him, but in the, in the mind and, and heart of the learner. Uh, and with that, he managed to, to um, practically bring up a variety of, of oud players. I mean, um, uh, if you compare me with the other learners who learned with Nariman, we are not similar at all. We each became what we wanted to become. And that I, th I think is a very valuable experience to share. That's the mark of a truly successful teacher, yes. Uh. Interesting. I tried to be short this time. <laughs> no, it is very, it's just no, no, no limit. Yeah, so uh, I'll just throw, through, uh, throw some points here about this learning process where things talk about age, talent, giftedness, uh, talking about where students come from, the type of music or instrument, one or more. Uh, if there are shortcuts, uh, the idea of uh, creativity and uh, imagination, and so on, and, and even the concept of graduation, or maybe a student completed the learning process to a level where we say, okay, now you are a musician. So these are some points that all go around the idea of the learning, uh, including the meshk and the ta'lim, as you said, Rose, right? Mm -hmm. So I would like to hear about the effectiveness of, of learning. I mean, what is it exactly that, that makes a learning process effective for an individual or a group? I would say to become themselves. Well, I mean, uh, maybe maybe I can just add a bit to this to, to this uh, I mean, to these points. Um, I mean, we have to differentiate. Are we are we talking about uh, um, learning um, how it how it was and how it changed? And the possibilities that now we, we, we have, I mean, nowadays, um, I mean, I know, I know so many good musicians, for example, who uh, uh, claim to be all autodetectic musicians. So for them, for example, is autodetecticism uh, something very, very important, which means that they actually taught themselves. But again, if you ask them, if you go deeper, like, how did you teach yourself? How did that process go? you would discover that they actually listened to everything possible. Everything fell into their hands they were listening to. Um, and actually, so, so nowadays with, 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 this, with the, tech, the technological possibilities that we have, um, 
Uh, and I said, we are really fortunate that uh, we, st we live in this, uh, in this time um, that enables us to, 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 to just, I mean, we are just one click far from anything we want to, to see or to, to watch or to, to, to listen to. Um, so you could listen to, 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 to music and learn by uh, imitating first uh, getting uh, inspirations, um, uh, ideas, um, but actually in, in order to, 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 be, I mean, to be able to do so, I think that there should be uh, at the beginning maybe some kind of introduction to, to music. Uh, and it should be, um, in a way, uh, um, a healthy introduction to to music. I love the idea, for example, uh, the, the the experiment that uh, Ross did with uh, his former student that he made him compose just uh, in a very a very early stage. I wouldn't I wouldn't actually have to, I mean uh, or this idea wouldn't have come to my mind at all actually. Um, uh, but it's it's. I mean, here you see, I, 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 I learn, I grab this, this idea. It's very interesting. I mean, one have to, 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 to let that go through the, I mean, the mind. Um, um, I can speak also of something which, uh, I mean, which you could call the subconscious. Uh, I mean, Ross decided to to learn this music, to learn the music that he's performing today or that the music he called his, 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 his music. He, he, did, he took one day that decision, uh, he said he's an Irishman, I mean, he took a decision to learn that music, uh, which is a different approach, for example, uh, than somebody who actually grows in an environment, uh, listening to, uh, to, to different musics of the environment or from the environment he's, he's, he's grown up uh, into. Um, uh, and again, it's a, it's a question of, of timing. Um, so when we grew up, for example, we had only few uh, kinds of music that we were, I mean, we had access to. As I said, now we have more uh, uh, opportunities. In a way, learning music, I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's similar to learning a language. I mean, it is very similar to learning a language. For example, I have two daughters who are growing up in Germany. We speak Arabic at home, uh, but again, I mean, they are the the, the, the environment they live uh, they live in. Uh, uh, it's of course more German. So even when they speak Arabic, they phrase the sentences more in a German way, mm -hmm. you know, than in Arabic way. So they think German. They speak Arabic, but they think but they think in in in, in, I mean, in, in German. Um, uh, but if, if they were, for example, listening to Arabic from every side, from every corner, I'm sure this would be, uh, this would be totally different. Mm. Uh, and I would say that uh, learning music is, is, is in a way, is in a way, in a, in a way similar. We, I mean, in uh, between uh, parentheses, ethnomusicologists, we would say the best way to learn about, not to learn, but to learn about a music or a musical culture is to delve into that culture, is to do this so-called participant observation, to go there, to spend as much time as possible, because that's, I mean, the longer the stay, the longer the field work, the more uh, that is the, uh, the, the probability of, uh, of things getting repeated, you know, so repetition, actually, you can uh, decipher uh, patterns, let's say. Um, so this is also another aspect. I mean, you want to learn music, you want to learn a language, you should you should go there where the music is played. You should maybe go there where it is it is it is it is spoken in the language. Nowadays, maybe it's not even anymore necessary because I mean, so many people learn languages using their applications. I mean, your phone applications, uh, having tandem uh, courses with uh, with indigenous uh, people, native speakers, let's say from all over the world. So I mean I don't know what 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 role does I mean does this um, I mean, the media I mean the, the, the internet or the social networks today also uh, I mean play I, I believe it's a, it's a, it's a it's a very important um, aspect. Yeah. I'd well, like it just, was a question uh, for. Yeah. Go ahead, Nicole. 
Yeah. Uh, just following on, on uh, a comparison Salah put forward, uh, I also do believe that learning uh, music is, is similar or could be compared with learning a language. So uh, these are the questions I've thought about, but I don't have the answers yet. So I would like to hear opinions on that. And uh, in, uh, in a language, uh, you know what, or to some extent, you can somehow know what you expect from uh, the speaker of the language. I mean, based on that, they are also doing placement uh, exams and, and define courses and levels and everything, right? You, you can define what to expect from a speaker or writer in a language to be able to do. Mm -hmm. Can you compare that with a, with what we expect from a musician? Uh, because that is the key thing to define, uh, at least on the paper, to define what we want in a learning process. That uh, what I said about my teacher, what he he ha I, I assume he had clearly in mind, was that he somehow knew for different uh, things that can happen in the life of a musician or different possibilities for a musician, he somehow had a path in mind and he could take the, the ones that, that he thought would be more uh, talented or whatever for this or that or the other one. Uh, he could take them through the path suitable to, um, to acquire those uh, skills or whatever you want to define them as. Uh, so can you compare that as well? I mean, can you say what, what we aim for <coughs> or what we expect from a musician to do? I mean, it's, it's, it, it, in a way, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, I know it's very dangerous. Uh, I mean, it works in a way, this comparison, but in other, in our, looking at it from another side, it's, it's also a dangerous comparison. Uh, I mean, you could master a language, but you will never become a poet. You will never write a good poem in that language. So, I mean, you could learn, for example, I mean, uh, I don't know, you, you can be a very good uh, violinist or cellist or whatever, playing in an orchestra, but you will never be able to improvise one jazzy phrase. You will not be able to compose a sonata or whatever, or any song or something. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm, I'm aware, aware of that. Uh, of that uh, just, just a little uh, parenthesis. So, it, does this mean that we, uh, we can uh, educate musicians to become like actors and actresses more than poets? Which I think Pavel <laughs> was, was referring to uh, as, as performers. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, this is up to the to the to the individual uh, uh, musicians. I mean, you can do. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, everything possible to get anything out of these of some students, but you will never uh, achieve that. Uh, uh, and sometimes you put the the, the, the minimum effort in on others, and there they and here they are. They are the, they become the best. Uh, I mean, uh, composers or musicians. I mean. Um, uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't also also have like. A, 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 I'd a, like to add one thing. one 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 thing here. Uh, Suzuki, the, the the guy who has the school of Suzuki violin, mm. teaching kids. He had a book called Nurtured by Love, and he always talked about the idea that we learn music the same way, like language. And in the first classes of violin for kids, he will bring their parents or one parent hand over the violin to the parent and, and the kid will be watching the, the parent learning how to hold the violin, the bow, the posture, maybe uh, playing the first uh, one or two pieces. And from there, the kid will just learn in the same manner, the way the parent speaks or walk or maybe eat or whatever like uh, in the house. So he believes uh, in, in that way and uh, uh, Maybe this is uh, a, a very natural way we learn a lot of things, uh, we, a lot of things beyond even language, isn't it? Mm -hmm, yes. I mean, this is. Uh, I mean, it's 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 a very fair point. I mean, I mean, maybe the 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 the, the main denominator here is that mm -hmm. okay, you should maybe start to, at a young age. No, no, no question. So, in, in in this way, of course, there is a comparison between language and and uh, and learning the language and learning learning music. I mean, I can give examples or from from my own. Uh, I mean, uh, humble experience. Uh, I mean, the time I grew up in 
and the region I grew up in, for example, we do not favor meters, musical meters, or rhythms, or whatever, or usul, for example, which in other parts of the world are called aksak. So we don't have a lot of uh, repertoire, traditional repertoire in 7 8, in 9 8, in 10 8. And I was astonished to see people that can even dance and clap to these rhythms without having any any problem you know so they grow up with these with these rhythms so they have them in their blood so to say yeah? mm -hmm. where i had to i had to 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 analyze them to to say okay three two two three and so on you know uh, in order to learn how to perform um, uh, for example georgiana i mean i need to, to to listen to a lot of repertoire in georgiana and sing in georgiana where just our neighbors our neighbors the iraqis for example they have this 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 rhythm and even Almost every second song, traditional song, is in Georgiana. Yeah. So they actually, it's in their blood, so they can sing and dance to it without any problem. And interestingly, it's a 10 8 rhythm. Yeah. When you ask musicians, how do you teach that to, to, to people, to ordinary people? I mean, if you tell them on stage, well, this is a 10 8 uh, rhythm or a dance in a 10 8 uh, meter, um, this, I mean, normal audience wouldn't understand that. He said, no, we, bring, we teach them how to, to clap to a 6-8 rhythm, which everybody can. Yeah. So one, two, three, one, two, three, and then this becomes the ta 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 which is the 10-8 uh, rhythm. Um, so they have this in the, in, in, I mean, they, they grew up listening to, 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 to this rhythm. It's in their, uh, it's in their uh, music. It's just like also, uh, I mean, growing up listening to these, uh, I would allow myself to call them like microtones, you know, so you don't, uh, you don't, it, it does not sound uh, strange for you, you know, but for, for foreigners, of course, this first you have to get used to, uh, to them or for or different interpretations of intervals. Um, but maybe just let me introduce one aspect, which I also as a parent actually uh, noticed recently, which I've never thought about, um, uh, which is, uh, I do miss, I do really miss children's songs in our languages, with our music, with our complicated, between parentheses, complicated rhythms for our children. Mm -hmm. So even when they get introduced to this music, it would be complicated. Actually, it's, it's the best way to introduce them to this way is to, 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 to compose songs for children in Makam Rast, in Makam Bayati, in Makam Sabah, you know, uh, with, 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 with kind of tricky, uh, I mean, for, we call them tricky, but I'm sure that children, they will not conceive uh, <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a similar way because they would just learn and they absorb everything. Um, why don't we have this? I don't know how, how, how is that situation in Iraq or in Iran, sorry, or in, or in Greece or in, in Turkey. I'm not, uh, I'm not aware of that, but I know that I grew up, uh, I mean, listening to children's songs, which are, translated from uh, Western languages and the melodies were just like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and the Oeuvre de la, de la Lune and so on. I mean, so um, uh, yeah. it's an interesting aspect to think about. I don't know if you have other of your own experiences with these, uh, with these things. I'm sure there's a lot others want to say. I just want to answer a part of what you asked about. In Iran, there was the same problem, but then there were some attempts to bring in some of the uh, original heritage, let's call it, into the children's song. And I remember from my childhood, there was a song that was played, uh, I mean, the Santur part was played by one of the masters, Reza Varzande, whose uh, tone color of Santur is very special, and I can still remember that. And then there was a very uh, kind of star uh, child singing, uh, a, a very simple, uh, what do you call it, like rhyme about a, a cat on it but the melody was also somehow kurdish sorry it wasn't about a cat it was about a rooster and i never forgot it and i always remembered it and then later there were other attempts to to teach uh, children playing tom back with, with uh, rhymes uh, but also song in persian dascos so there have been some attempts in iran but very few not enough i would say there was one old teaching device in Ottoman music called Karinatik, which was quite interesting. It was not necessarily for children, but the idea could be applied to children. 
where it, it was basically it was a composition and the lyrics of the song are actually describing the makam being played and uh, it goes through different makams it shows you how to modulate from the one to the other and the lyrics that you're singing are referring to that makam it was a very very effective device actually mm -hmm. uh, it's something which nobody's really worked on in recent times that much but it, uh, it could potentially be very interesting i think in the byzantine tradition you had something similar yes, yeah so. exactly as I was uh, going to yeah. tell, there is a tradition of this uh, since the uh, 13th century, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is a, co a whole composition and describing yeah. what, what is happening with the melody and the, uh, especially yeah. what is happening with the signs mm -hmm. and the particular uh, stereotypical phrases. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Chanders also developed this uh, in order to describe macams. So this is, yes. uh, they, they have such compositions uh, from, uh, from uh, 18th century, for example. Eight. We have some essays that um, compare, compare the macams with hijos, with modes, uh, Byzantine mm -hmm. modes, and they have this such sharp compositions described with mm -hmm. Dugyar going to Segyar and so on. Mm -hmm. So that is such a tradition. It's an interesting idea which could be developed upon in a more contemporary sense, you know, today, not necessarily for specialized people, but uh, as, as a teaching device, perhaps for children at an earlier stage of learning, something of a, maybe perhaps a bit simpler, of course. Mm -hmm. But there are plenty of relatively simple phrases which could be used in the context of such compositions, yeah. which uh, that could be quite uh, an interesting thing for people to do that, a project to be done. Yeah. yeah. Now, to conclude about the point of effective uh, process of learning, Ross. Oh, <laughs> well, I I've had students ranging from outrageously talented who you know you, you couldn't even keep up with the speed that they were learning at and I've also had students who uh, worked at something less than a snail's pace um, and I've had everything in between and I learned to see both of those extremes and everything in between as equally interesting yeah. because what you have to do is you have to divorce yourself from the expected result uh, because the expected result has to be expected by that person, not by you. Mm -hmm. um, I remember I had one student uh, many years ago uh, who would practice quite literally four or five hours every day and who from lesson to lesson learned absolutely nothing. And I was in a terrible dilemma. What do I do? Do I tell this poor fellow that you know maybe you should try something else? This is not for you. He wasn't stupid. He was a very very intelligent person, very normal person in every sense, and uh, you know very nice person also. And I felt horrible because I was you know I was working in a music school, so I wasn't in a position to tell him you know you know uh, please come. Don't, you don't have to pay me. I'm happy to teach you. He was also very proud. He would never accept that. So uh, I didn't know what to do. Do I tell this person that this is not for you or do I tell him, uh, do I have the right to burst his bubble? You know, no. And eventually, after thinking about this and spending several sleepless nights actually wondering what to do, it suddenly dawned on me that this person had never asked me, how am I doing? Um, so he had never, he never confronted me with an interest in the result. And I thought, okay, well, if he doesn't ask me, then I, I don't have the right to impose my view. If he ever does ask me for my view, then I'm obliged to give it to him honestly. But he never did ask that question. And this process carried on for almost two years. And he got nowhere, according to my criteria. But obviously this, uh, and, and his lesson every week was the big moment of you know, his week. It was a very strange situation. But obviously, this whole process meant something on a certain level to him, which I was unable to understand. But it's not my business to understand how he sees it, if I can't. It's, it, I just have to play the role that he has given to me. And uh, on the other hand, you know, I may have had somebody who was uh, learned things in no time at all, you know, 
okay, my job is the same, just to give what I have and let the other person take it if they can, if they wish to. And they will do with it what they can, what they will, and what 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 they're expecting to get out of it. And it may not always be apparent to me what they're actually after, mm -hmm. but that doesn't change anything for me. That means I just have to do my, my job and try my very best to give them as much as possible in a way which hopefully will be accessible to them. Mm -hmm. But different people learn in radically different ways and different people actually live in different realities. And uh, it's sometimes, you know, sometimes extreme examples in learning abilities or what we call diff difficulties, uh, they sort of shock us into an awareness of the fact that different people do actually live in very different realities. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to be in our own reality and give what we can. That's all we can do. <sighs> Interesting. Any any other point to be added to this uh, process of learning from you guys? Well, maybe one 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 tiny aspect, which is, uh, uh, I mean, I've noticed also uh, again uh, from my own uh, experience and working with uh, with the historical sources on, on our music, uh, if I may call it our music. <laughs> Um, um, I mean, it's a very interesting fact that if that exactly, I mean, the, 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 when you start learning music at least at a music at a music school, you are directly introduced to major and minor scales. Mm -hmm. It's again, uh, uh, what is a major scale? It's the white keys on the on the piano. But I mean, we all know that actually the main scale for for the Eastern Oriental music tradition. Um, whether it's uh, Greece or Turkey or uh, I mean, uh, uh, Persian, it is the word, um, it's the Makam Rast mm -hmm. with the neutral third. And every other step actually is a corruption of the primary degrees. So Buselik, for example, the, the major third, let's call it, is a corruption of the neutral third of the step Sega. So we, when we teach our children, we teach them the corrupted interval or step, and then they have to figure out that actually with the notation, it's you, we use a coron or we use a, 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 a inverted uh, mm -hmm. uh, flat uh, sign and so on, uh, which is which is schizophrenic. I mean, uh, uh, the whole system actually is should be based on the Macau Rust and all all the other makams and the thing are actually uh, i mean get, getting from i mean based or built uh, on the on the corruption of the primary degrees i remember one episode uh, um, uh, i don't think it was um, uh, uh, an, an, uh, a nadi podcast but it could have been between ahmed al khatib the wood player and uh, antariq abdullah our dear colleague and uh, okay. scholar uh, Ahmed Al Khatib said something very interesting. He's a wood player. I'm, I'm sure. I mean, you are acquainted with him. Uh, he said that why not start teaching children actually the very simplest, the very I mean, the simplest and the very natural, uh, the most natural position, which is first finger and the second finger on the neck of the wood, teaching them the intervals of Maqam Bayati. So if you have the the, the string of Duga. The first finger would be Sega, the second would automatically would be Charga. So this is the most natural position to start with. I love this idea because this actually enforces again the idea of the, the, of, the uh, of the intervals of Makam, uh, of the, let's call it the scale of Makam, of Makam Rast. No, on the contrary, the, the, all the, the textbooks for Oud, they start by teaching the major scale on the Oud which in itself is an unnatural position for the fingers, apparently. I mean, I will not uh, go so far out of the windows, uh, especially when Negar is among us and she's a wood player, she can um, uh, confirm or criticize this idea. But I love this idea that actually it's more natural on that instrument, the way it is built also, the, the, the strings which are tuned, uh, I mean, a fourth apart, uh, to start teaching the very natural position one, two, which is that neutral second and then the minor third, which is F and uh, 
diminished E. See, I see. I even call it diminished E because we think in in, in, in Western in Western in Western terms, but it is actually the primary degree. So, I think we should go back to these to these to this system to establish actually the Makam Ras and these intervals, and then uh, teach them the, the corrupted. Uh, so-called uh, corrupt. Even in the literature, they use the word cor corrupted, if sad, no? yeah. over the primary degree, in order to become a tertiary or, or a secondary degree. Yeah. So maybe that was my thought on that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love the idea of corruption. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to use that word for it. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's rampant uh, in part I, of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I come from Iran. Everything is corrupted. <laughs> I, I would like to, to touch on, on the idea of imagination. I mean, I think we lost that one uh, in, in the process of learning. I, I've tried. I, I can't say I have um, really found one effective way for that. But uh, I, I somehow became aware that in many uh, learners who, who would love to make music in all kinds of degrees, I mean, so, uh, making music starts with playing somebody else's uh, composition as well. It, you don't have to uh, create the melody yourself, but you are remaking it when you play it or sing it uh, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and I know people who would love to really do that, but they they seemed to lack something which would uh, put them in in a kind of prison uh, between the mechanics and what they think it it was uh, and I, I somehow came to the point that they don't have any imagination of sound somehow so uh, it it kind of made me think about trying different ways or making uh, coming up with different games to play in order to to kind of provoke a, a sort of uh, or, or, or trigger something in the mind of the learner <clears throat> so that they can start imagining the sound or an impression of what will come uh, even in a in a pre-composed melody or with time or with with rhythm or something and i came up with some simple games it came up uh, with, with some uh, suggestions for simple games like uh, when, when you're listening to something doesn't matter what genre it is or whatever just pause it uh, suddenly and and think of something uh, as could it be this coming could it be whatever, from an instrument or the rhythm, uh, this percussion or that percussion, would it be a, a sequence of the melody, whatever, depending on the level of the learner as well. And in some learners, I, I saw the uh, result, it, it worked, to, to kind of uh, bring them a bit of imagination of sound. But I can't say it was fully successful, but I would like to invite everybody to think about, or if anybody has some experience in doing that because i think that's what we really need uh, and and that's also in my opinion uh, some skill that the best musicians have right i mean uh, you call a musician uh, as a musician with musicianship <laughs> uh, excellent when they really uh, sound uh, as as if they um they have put the sound alive, like even if it's a melody you have heard a thousand times, when they perform it, it, there is something alive in it. And I don't think it can happen without something up here. But th that's my suggestion. Uh, I would love to hear comments and ideas in that. It's this special quality which you referred to, we refer to that uh, as owning your notes. Yeah. which it's it's important and it's it's a process of uh which in, invokes imagination perception it's it's a whole way of, of actually uh uniting with what you're playing and th this is uh this is something very important actually it's something which is not stressed in musical education either uh, the, perhaps the most difficult thing to do in music 
is not to be a great virtuoso and play very fast, you know, that sort of stuff, no. The most difficult thing to do is to be 100% in what you're doing while you're doing it. Uh, this is the quality which young children have, of course, when they're playing with their, their game, with their toy, they're 100% there, that there's nothing else. Those of us who are somewhat older, we encounter problems with that, uh, that department. And that, you know, we're doing something, but we're thinking, oh, I have to pay my taxes, or I have to do wash the dishes or something like that. Uh, that our minds are, are sort of uh, dispersed somewhat. So, uh, music is actually, and this is one thing which I've, I've often stressed to people as an indication of, of the great value of musical education. The worst result you can have in an attempt to learn to play an instrument or to sing or to do anything musical, the worst possible result that you could have is to become a better listener. Um, really, uh, nothing worse can happen to you than that. Um, so everybody, I think, should give it a try. It's also an amazing tool to learn something which is, is a big problem. Anybody in education today will tell you that the concentration span of children today uh, is quite problematic, mm -hmm. that they don't have much of an attention span. And this is partly due to being bombarded with things left, right and center from, you know, on mobile phones or social media or whatever else. Um, and that the, the study of music is one of the most pleasant and certainly most effective ways of learning concentration. Mm -hmm. The concentration necessary to play a 10 minute piece of music is far, far greater than that which is possessed by the average person. Yeah. And it's something which anybody can learn, actually. It's not something which is just for a select few. No, anybody can learn that. But it, it is something which you learn. So, yeah, uh, and there are ways you can start just by gradually introducing children to this through the process which Nagar suggests through through games or things which challenge your perception or challenge your imagination or challenge your uh, ability to to hear and remember things. Um, and I think it's something which should start from a very early age for all children, really, regardless of whether they're going to become musicians or not. That, that's not the, the goal is for them to acquire a relationship with music. Um, I think you mentioned Salah in the beginning that you, you know people who they say, I just listen, I only listen to this music, I only listen to that music, yeah. Yeah, I, I encounter that here on Crete as well. I have you know, fathers of young boys and my son only listens to Cretan music. Whenever I hear that, it always makes me terribly sad, actually because they're not being encouraged to learn the value of different types of music and how to discern that which is of value. They're just being taught to sort of latch on to one particular thing as a symbol of their identity. But yeah, um, musical education from a very early age should be something which is offered to everybody. Uh, and through the medium of, uh, as, as you suggested, Nagar, of, of simple games or simple compositions which any child can learn to sing, but which uh, beyond just being pleasant and enjoyable, actually have something which they're imparting to the student as well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, I, I really enjoy it. May I add just one, one simple, I mean, single point, which is, uh, uh, I mean, we have also to, to, to distinguish between learning the music and learning playing an instrument. Uh, so we, yes. so many people come and ask you, just teach me how to play the instrument, but then you see that actually they have, uh, they want to play different kinds of music on that instrument, that specific instrument. Yeah. So I have like also European... That's a problem, yeah. Exactly, yeah. students yeah. who want to, to master the kanun, but they don't want to play the, the, I mean, any oriental music on it. So they are interested in the instrument. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, uh, I, did, I, I never had the, I mean, the opportunity to, to try this, but I mean, um, I mean, earlier it was, I mean, at least this is what we read and learn about, that uh, teaching was more uh, of uh, uh, I mean, singing together, learning the rhythms together, and then in a very yes. late stage, in a very late stage, actually, you grab an instrument. And the instrument is then, in this case, only a vehicle, which allows you to trans, to, tra to trans, 
how do I say, to, uh, to, to uh, perform the music with this, with this technical aid, actually. At the end, it's, not, it's anything more than, uh, than that. The way I, I, I learned, which, which was a very classical uh, I mean, um, uh, way at the conservatory, we learn, we start with the instrument and then the music comes with it, the theory comes with it. So someone you are actually confronted with the boundaries of the instrument. And for example, as a Qanun player, I know that I cannot necessarily play like a singer or exactly do the phrasing of a singer because of the nature of the instrument, which is a plucked instrument. So I was like always uh, uh, jealous of the nay players or uh, of the uh, command players or uh, kemenje players or even clarinet players. I mean, whatever, whatever instrument can, that, that can imitate the human voice, this for me was more, and this, these are the instruments that make me happy, you know, when I, when I listen to music, um, because they are, closer to the, to the human voice and to the human soul, so to say. Um, but I'm now asking myself, actually, if I learn the music first and then try to use the instrument in order to produce music and not the, not the, other, way, not the other way around, uh, confined to the, t to, the, to the possibility of the instruments, play the music that you can play with it. Um, I think this could, uh, this could be... Um, which was an, uh, apparently an approach earlier, that this could be a healthy approach, is to first learn music. But again, this needs time, as Ross mentioned at the beginning. This needs, um, uh, uh, I mean, modesty on the, on the, on the side of, 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 the, of patience uh, of the students. Uh, it needs time, you know, to accept the idea that I have to spend so much time first learning the music, uh, uh, doing all these, uh, as maybe they are called them, games, or, 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 and then, and then choose an instrument which suits me, which is closer to, uh, to me after first learning the, the, the music. But this is a process that takes much longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Uh, do you like to have a break? I think we sat for a long time. We have a few more points to cover. Okay, let's have a, a short break. Oh, 
Şimdi Murat Oğuz. Yeah, so uh, talking about the learning process, maybe a point related to that is when we say a student has maybe passed the guild to being uh, a complete or maybe uh, a complete musician, that links also to what is uh, musicianship, right? Mm -hmm. So from your experience, what did the time tell you? I can start with this tiny anecdote again, yeah. which is my first encounter with my uh, uh, master, Munir Bashir, mm -hmm. when I was a child. I mean, he came uh, for a visit to the conservatory and he asked us to play something. Mm -hmm. And I wanted, of course, to uh, impress him and play some, uh, some fast stuff. Mm -hmm. He was like, looking at me like this and he says, okay, nice. Could you play a small taksim? And that's where I stopped, actually. Yeah. And that, I mean, since then, I know that actually um, playing fast, uh, playing, I mean, uh, longas or sirtos or, or I mean, uh, things with finger work, I mean, it's not, this is not uh, the music that one should strive for, actually. So there's, I mean, two different, two different worlds. Yeah. So actually, this is for me, musicianship. So I use this again also with the, with, with younger people, I mean, uh, indeed, it's just a triggering question, you know, to make them think about music. Uh, so, I mean, if we want, want to base our experience on our own music uh, uh, culture, it is definitely not fast music. It's yeah. definitely not uh, the technical side of it, but it's more the spiritual, it's more the, the, the musical side. Yeah, now taking it through the benchmark of curriculum and conservatory grades from 1 to 12, for example. You say you completed 12, you got a certification, you graduated, right? And uh, comparing this with the system of MESHK or TALIM or whatever, when is it the time that we say, for example, okay, you are now on your own? Uh, uh, may I? Yeah. I, I wouldn't take musicianship as graduation at all. I mean, uh, like what you explained, that uh, you, you say that the musician is on his or her own uh, after that. I, I more or less define musicianship as a, as a combination of uh, three things. One, uh, being sensitive to all aspects of sound. Mm -hmm. By that, I mean being sensitive to how uh you can change the, the the sound colors you can play around different sound colors how you can move between pitches between notes uh, so to speak uh, all all aspects you can play around the sound and then sensitivity to time which brings rhythm and meter and so on plus connecting it to your ideas and emotions which all together you, you, you call expression, right? Musical expression. Yeah. And this could happen from rather early stage. You don't have to be a master to, ha to be sensitive. I mean, the, the level of sensitivity changes. It's supposed to change during the time. Uh, I, I remember one painter once said that uh, learning painting is learning to look better. And I think it's the same with music. Uh, learning music is to hear better, to listen better, to, to find all these fine, uh, delicate uh, things that you can do with sound in a better way. And one of the things I used to do with students was that I would bring in different interpretations or different performances of the same, mm -hmm. even a song, doesn't matter what genre, from different people or the same person in different performances. Yeah. And then I would ask them to follow the, the differences, to compare, to find the differences they were putting into the same stuff. Like, like it was the same composition, the same melody, but how different are they performing it? Even only as a singer, I mean, not, not the instrumentation necessarily. And uh, the first session I did that, to my very surprise, I realized that they were all shocked thinking that, but this is the same thing. Yeah. It took them time to, to kind of have the lens 
to to look at the the details that uh, were different and I, I think that the further you go the more musicianship you are supposed to acquire that's my uh, interpretation of the idea yeah i, ha I have some thoughts to share uh, I, I i'm i'm thinking that i belong to two different let's say groups musical groups let's say uh, the one is the chanting group the other is the greek traditional let's say as, as a musician and i feel that nowadays it's like we uh, kind of lost the, this practical aspect of music that is very um, very important in both of these yeah. two gens in chanting if you are actual chanter in a church you have particul particular uh, role in the church. You have to um, have to be in communication with the priest, to follow particular tempos in order to, um, to follow the time, and uh, and your general uh, role is to make people to pray anyway to worship. On the other hand, if I play as a traditional musician in a situation like what we call glendi in Greek, which is like a fiesta, like a big, uh, um, a, a lot of people together and having fun, have, entertain uh, each other with a lot of uh, dancers and um, people singing together. Anyway, if you are the musician in this circumstance, um, you are uh, like a leader of um, a ceremony let's say and so again you have a practical role there and in this both of two these these two different circumstances um your role doesn't have to do a lot um in the way you play the particular intervals how expressive you are and uh, I don't see that. I don't think that these aspects of, mu of music are not important. But in these two um, styles, you have also some other factions that are very important. And um, I think that, that musicians um, not have to lose the functions of music uh, that are in different cir circumstances. Um, and different. For example, in old uh, in, in villages, in the the, the 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 past years, the main role of the musician was to make the people to dance, or the 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 first dancer. So if you if, if the mu musician uh, the kemenche uh, player for example the violin violin player if uh, the musician has the rhythm okay and the the groovy uh, this groove to make the dancer um, dancing that was the most important thing not the knowledge of makam not the expression. Um, Again, so in both uh, musical idioms and societies, what is important is music in practice. In um, um, in all the all the masters of chanting uh, used to say, "You are chanter only in the church, only if you chant." So uh, you have to learn, and you learn. You you. Um, you think yourself, you consider yourself as a chanter only if you can uh, go to the church and uh, chant with the priest and uh, be the leader of this ceremony. Okay, no, not the intervals, not the uh, all these uh, theoretical aspects that uh, in conservatoires we are learning for. Uh, and I feel that the same thing is happening uh, when I I place a musician in uh, in Greece. Uh, we have a lot of people. They want to 
um, they want to have fun to entertain themselves and you have to think about the order of the music of the of the songs to make a good order um to to um, to make them sing to see what is uh, what, what, for example now i i consider for their ages because the um, if the people are in 50s or 60s years old, they like particular songs. So you have to to uh, to respect um, their listenings, uh, what they want to listen, um, and make a particular program for them in order to have fun, in, or in order to um, to dance and sing with you. So this is a, a totally different. Um, circumstance, a different um, uh, mindset, approach of music than what we learn in um, cons conservatories. And I, I wanted to to give light on this uh, on these aspects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can we call that a DJ role? I mean, the function you, you just described. <laughs> as, as yeah, yeah, it's like DJ because actually when we play this music, we don't have program. Uh, we don't even um, know which is the first song, nothing at all. We just play. So because of this situation, we have this communication with the people. It's like they yeah. they lead us and we lead them. It's there the same thing in Kurdish. This, in Kurdish tradition, this, they have yeah. some. They, they have the local musicians, which in the past I've heard from my parents. They would call loti, uh, mm. and lotis were those who would play sorna and dohol or kamanche, and and they would uh, attend the the parties or, or gatherings, and they had such a job to to uh, to kind of. Uh, orchestrate the whole party with people dancing, eating, having fun. And the, the funny thing for me, well, not funny, but cute, is that when um, uh, keyboards came to existence, the musicians chose to play the same stuff, they, the same things they were playing on the Sorna before or on the Kamonche, now on the keyboard. Like and keyboard. They, they are called Loti Barri, which means the, the electric version of the Loti. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when they have a wedding party, they say, okay, we call this, this guy, he's a Lucy Barri, and he will run the party for us. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a function-based uh, or role-based kind of uh, musicianship. Yes, yeah, so, so yeah. what is uh, a music, uh, music ship? What, what you said before in this, yeah. uh, in this situation, you have to, to develop different abilities. Um, to to have an empathy with the people, mm -hmm. and uh, if you if you see some videos, old videos, um, or if you listen to some old recordings, uh, you can feel this. You can feel that musicians uh, are not focused on the particular musical elements, mm -hmm. but are focused on the event, on what's happening here with these particular people around. Uh, and, and so, following this uh, ethnological, let's say, uh, as, uh, approach, musician also uh, has to be, let's say, an um, an anthropologist, not focusing on the music, but, but focusing on the circumstances of the whole environment. What's happening here? The center is the music, but the music has a role in this. Uh, particular event. Interesting. Rose, I think you have something to say on Salah. <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, I find uh, very interesting the approach taken by both Negar and by Gerasmus. Negar stressed the human qualities which are necessary to be a musician, yeah. and uh, Gerasmus stressed uh, context, yeah. which I think is very important. Um, and, and actually those two different approaches actually are not so different, they, they actually meet. And uh, it's sort of a meeting of that which I think produces what you might refer to as an accomplished musician. I would add one other feature uh, which I find to be important, which is how does the musician see him or herself 
in relation to music. Um, basically, we can, we can have two rough sort of categories of musicians. There is one musician who everything he or she says, does, plays, everything about this person is saying, look at me. Yeah. And there's the other musician who everything that they do, everything they say, everything that they're, everything about them is saying, listen to it. Yeah. Um, for me, this second category is the one who actually is a musician. The first category, no matter how brilliant they may be, they're a dog barking up the wrong tree. And uh, <laughs> it's just... <laughs> that's not what music is I mean it's very important that we see ourselves in the service of music and not music in the service of ourselves and uh, that's what I think uh, is it's like the glue between all of the other qualities which make a musician I think and I think it's it's very important interesting I totally agree to the, the aspect of uh, the context-based uh, yeah. uh, thing. I mean, uh, um, you could be the, I mean, a very good musician in, in, in your own music, let's say, but uh, I mean, the minute you play, for example, with, with, with other people trying to play different music, uh, you simply uh, 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 how do you say um, uh, uh, what was the word um, loss uh, you simply fail sorry you simply fail uh, I mean uh, if they expect you for example to, to share the stage with the blues musicians for example and you are a musician coming from the east let's say and they give you a phrase of 12 bars you know until you improvise something on that and on this the, on, on that specific uh, uh, accord sequence or sequence of chords i mean you you will fail unless you are acquainted with that music edition and so on so um, that's when some people start saying well i mean he's a limited musician he's one but i mean why, why do we look at things uh, this way? If we put this person in their context, exactly, actually they are, uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, fulfilling the function, let's say, uh, convincing, and they are the, the best of their caliber, let's say. Yeah. Um, uh, so it, it, it depends. I mean, uh, indeed, it is, it is very much context dependent. Um, uh, the same thing I, I, I can, I mean, I remember also a friend of mine, a Turkish musician, without uh, mention, I mean, uh, giving the names. Uh, he said, if you want to be a great musician, you should, uh, you should play in the tavern, in the taverna. Uh, because there where you become a solid musician and a canoe player, of course, you know. Uh, I mean, he, may, he, might have a, he might have a point. Uh, I mean, the, 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 I mean, the, the we are all, we know what, what how it goes uh, what's going on in, in a taverna and uh, when um, uh, i mean an ensemble starts playing i mean uh, it's loud it's uh, you need to uh, i mean to uh, uh, i mean to, to play the whole night and uh, uh, if you have to do now a taksim you have to do a taksim if you uh, i mean you need to have the repertoire also so you learn much uh, I mean, a lot of repertoire. So this is the way to improve your musicianship is to to to, to participate in that kind of, um, uh, of music. Um, so it is um, it is it is. I mean, it depends on the context. Again, I mean, Gerasimus uh, is completely right when he says. I mean, if I mean, if you are supposed to entertain the people and you fail to do so, then you are not a good musician. But if you if, if you do that. Uh, then uh, mean you have them in your uh, orbit, let's say. Um, uh, the other aspect is that, um, uh, which which is, I mean, is, is again, uh, of course, upon the the question of, of teaching music and when to say that someone has reached, I mean, a certain level of, of musicianship. 
I think that it is also the role of the teacher. Uh, the teacher should the, the teachers should know their own abilities and that should should know their own um, uh, uh, boundaries. Let's say uh, a good teacher would actually tell the uh, pupils to search for another teacher. They reach they took they learned everything possible and that they cannot teach them anything more. And this is what they can uh, what they can do, and they should seek uh, uh, another teachers. Um, uh, this is important. So many so many teachers actually uh, keep their students because, of course, it's 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 a source of of, of, of profit in a way or another, uh, and they keep them in that uh, belief that they are dependent of them. Uh, but it's actually it should be it should be they should be honest and say no, please now open your wings and go. Uh, I taught you everything. I I know. Go and 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 search for 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 other teachers, or learn from 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 other colleagues and uh, and so on. Which is which is very important. So uh, in short, there's a lack in in in, in didactic uh, um, teaching methods. I guess. So one thing: should we abandon this uh, the music uh, schools? We cannot do so. I mean, we should adhere to that to, to that system because it's also a place where people meet, where students learn from other students. It's a, a place of uh, of, um, of encounter. Uh, you play many different uh, things. You are open to, to to different styles and so on. Uh, but we don't have, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know, we don't have uh, institutions who teach teachers to become teachers. Uh, and how to actually to to I mean um, so pedagog pedagogically speaking I mean to 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 how to teach pupils uh, 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 music you could be the the best musician but as a teacher actually you fail and uh, you could be a very humble musician with very I mean uh, humble abilities also or techniques or whatever. But uh, you are a good teacher. I mean, you put the students on a, on a, on a, on a good path. Uh, you teach them the, the right way to hold an instrument or, or to play phrases and things. Uh, and then you make them uh, fly away, so to say. Um, I mean, these uh, are my thoughts about, uh, about that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, may I say something? Oh, go Sorry. Ahead again. Go ahead again. No, go no. Ahead again. no, no. I no, wanted please, to challenge Salah on one point. <laughs> uh, and that was about... Uh, uh, sorry, I can't resist this one. Uh, you, you said something which I, <laughs> I would like to, to discuss. And uh, you said that if, if you think you're a musician, but you can't entertain people like in a taverna, then you're not a good musician. Uh, but I, I personally think that music as in that function as uh, serving entertainment is only one function of music. So um, you, you can- You lost my words, by the way. Okay. <laughs> I'm done, thank you. Uh, Rose, you were about to say something. We encounter an, inter an interesting problem at the Musical Workshop Labyrinth, which is that I would suggest that 70% of our students are learning an instrument, which is from somewhere that they're not from. And uh, that that presents some problems, especially in helping them to understand where are you, at what level are you? Because you know, if you're if you're a young Turkish person learning saz in Turkey, you've got thousands of saz players all around, and you know where you are. It's 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 difficult to not know where you are. So, and sometimes we get people who play an instrument which is from another culture, not from their own culture. They quite often imagine that they're doing really well, but in fact, if you want to look at it objectively with, within the context of that instrument in its native environment, maybe their view is a little bit distorted. So I quite often tell them, well, look, if you're, you know, if, let's say you're learning to how, to, how to play the saz. Okay, go to any major Turkish city, and in that city you will find the musician's cafe, or tea house. Go there with your instrument and take it out and say, hello, I'm here, I'm playing this as, and play it. If you're good, they'll say, oh, bravo, great, well, well done, yeah, have a drink. 
Um, if you're not so good, they'll go, meh, you need a lot of work. But you should take that as a compliment because it means that you are on, you are within the subject. Yeah, you do belong to our community, but you're just not very good yet. If they look at you very politely and just go, that means you are from another planet. We do not recognize what you're doing. <laughs> and this, unfortunately, is very often because they're very polite. You see, this is very often mistaken as approval. And it's, it's, you have to be careful with some of these, some of these students. Sometimes they, they imagine that because they have, they've received this particular reception, that, oh, suddenly I'm okay now. <laughs> okay. But no, it's just the other poor fellow trying to be polite. He doesn't know what to say. Uh, but uh, you're completely from another planet and off the subject. So it is important basically to, to find a place within what I would call a peer group it is also is quite important. And this is a very important part of context, of course. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, it is possible for people to be carried away by their imagination to a certain degree and uh, to go off on rather extreme tangents. But yeah, it is, it is an important thing to realize, not that your time as a student has ended. No, that never ends. But that a time for the beginning of another activity begins. Yes. Uh, you're now in a position to actually perform for people. Uh, and, you know, you have, some, you have something to share with other people now. Uh, and part of your responsibility now is not just to learn new things, but also to cultivate to an even better degree your ability to share what you have with other people. Excellent. Excellent. So shall we move to the next point? Is there any other comment on this? Yes, by all means. Yes, yes. Uh, OK, now part of the daily activity or maybe frequent activity of a musician is to practice. So what did time tell about an effective practice for this kind of music? Less is more. Well, I'll... <laughs> is it? Uh, I'm more. joking. <laughs> I can tell you something of my experience in uh, in India, where you know Indian musicians they practice very very long hours, and it's very arduous and very difficult. Uh, and so you know, my own teacher, uh, his students were practicing eight, nine, ten hours a day, and things like that, and I was expected to. Sort of do the same. Yeah. And so I set about one day sort of trying to practice 10 hours. And of course, I wasn't very successful. I was getting distracted. And he eventually sort of told me, look, that's not such an easy thing to do. And it's not something you do immediately. Um, you start practicing one hour every morning, one hour every, every evening, do that for a week. Then in the second week, add a half hour at midday. In the third week, add another half hour to that half hour in midday, and you're now doing three hours a day. Then the next week, add another a half hour to the morning and a half hour to the evening. And you build up, like you gradually join the whole day together. If you want to practice that intensely, that's the way to learn how to do it. But I, I personally don't think that's a good idea. Um, I think that uh, living with music within the context of your everyday activity so it's just under the surface working in there is as important as holding the instrument and practicing. It's a bit like the value of sleep to daily activity, basically. But, you know, this puts everything in order and this is, this is an essential component. Um, even though in my youth, which is a long time ago, um, I used to practice very, very long hours and things like that. I don't think that that was really all that beneficial. And I've never really seen the benefit of practicing any more than five hours a day. Uh, and I say that as a professional musician, of course, because I mean, as professional musicians, uh, we put in a full day's work like anyone else. I mean, it's not that we sit around doing nothing. Uh, and so, yes, uh, on the days when you have the ability to do that and you don't have a lot of other things to do, uh, I mean, I usually try and wake up very early in the morning and uh, do my practice very in the morning hours before, uh, you know, the world wakes up, basically. And, 
yeah, so, so you have to establish a certain routine in a way, a certain discipline. But that should not be something forced. I mean, uh, I can remember times in my life, and even today, when it's difficult to put the instrument down and do something else. Yeah. So the discipline has to apply equally to being able to enable yourself to practice for long hours, but also it has to apply to being able to tell yourself, now put it down and do something else. Yeah. Uh, so you don't become a sort of a, a, a one-minded person, you sort of just stuck on one particular thing. Yeah. Because, as uh, Negara mentioned earlier, that music is very much if incorporating all of this into your life and into your music, or all of your life into the music and everything that you feel and experience, and this has to go in there. So it's not just a question of uh, falling in love with your fingers and training them to run all over the place. You know, that's that's not what it's about. But you do have to develop a certain technique. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. And what it's do we balance. practice? What do we practice uh, in that routine? for this kind of music is it pieces not routine. yeah there are technical there are technical issues which you can do the exercises which are very very good uh, but exercises which are not necessarily uh, about speed or things like that we're not sort of turning the instrument into sort of a, a type of kalashnikov to fire upon our listener and <laughs> no it's, it's you want to give them something beautiful the most difficult yeah. exercise i know uh, and the one which I still do every day uh, for for lira, for example, a bowed instrument, you could do it for violin, it's the same, yeah. is making the bow go from one side to the other as slowly and as loud as possible. Mm. Which means you have to, you know, I mean, if, usually if you try and do that, you go, uh, it gets a bit shaky. Yeah. And to do it as slowly and loud as possible, that's the most difficult thing to do. Mm. So that's a very good exercise to do. That's something which trains your dexterity in in a way which is much more important than speed speed yes it's useful of course it is and we do develop that also you want to develop in your practice you want to take uh let's say a specific piece of music a specific composition is another aspect of your practice play it and Try and find different ways of approaching different sections of that particular piece, different phrases, different ways of playing that phrase, different ways of interpreting it, mm-hmm. and different ways of seeing it. Mm-hmm. So that's where you, you, you sort of try and hone your uh, interpretive skill, so to speak. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, another section of your, your practice should be, I think, uh, dedicated to improvisation, especially in the type of music which we all play, which requires improvisation to a large degree. It should be something you're doing every day. And also another thing, which uh, I think is also very important, if you have the, build, the capability to do that, it's a good idea uh, every day to record yourself playing something and listen to it carefully. Mm-hmm. Uh, now that recording equipment is easily accessible to all of us and cheap, mm-hmm. it really helps a lot to, to you know sit back and listen to yourself carefully how you played something. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, yeah, to see how you react to that. Not to start sort of beating yourself or anything like that, no, but to, uh, you know, to see what could I have done better with this piece of music. Yeah. Interesting. Thank no you self-flagellation is necessary. No, no, that's, that's not necessary, no. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. <sighs> I'd like to hear from, from you, Nagar, Salah, and Rasim, was about practice. The effective practice. From well, actually, I can only agree to what have been uh, has been said so far. Uh, maybe just add one one thing is that uh, I mean, in general, um, the ex- I mean, exercising or uh, practicing um, uh, should be uh, put in the service of music. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the end, I mean, if we practice just to practice, um, you will find many people who actually play better than uh, than us, and then <laughs> just uh, I mean, playing every every hard passage and so on. Uh, and also, the question is, uh, in, in 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 what sense? Uh, uh, I mean, our our music, or at least the music that I that I play and I prefer to play. Does not necessarily, uh, as Ross has also mentioned, does not necessarily uh, depend on the uh, 
this um, uh, very uh, impressive, mind-blowing uh, technique, te technical abilities. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, this simple, simple bow exercise might be more effective, which it, I'm sure it is more effective than uh, than playing a scale up and down uh, in, in a fast in a fast way. Uh, with this, you impress people, but uh, maybe you don't satisfy them musically. So, um, uh, so you should know what kind of exercise you. Uh, I totally agree uh, with with, uh, with the because this is the the way that I used to to, to practice. I I mean, I one day woke I mean, wake woke up and uh, woke up and and, and noticed that uh, I can play very easily without any effort. Scales up and down the kanun. <laughs> Playing up and down, I mean, uh, ascending and descending scales. This is not not so 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 hard anymore. So what's the point in practicing this? Or I think then I started, for example, trying to improve my um, uh, my tremolo. Let's call it uh, starting to play. I mean, uh, I mean, playing downwards and then playing upwards. Actually, I started to do this when I was a pupil to figure out that this is a technique that actually has been used, for example, by Turkish musicians for a long time. Mm. You know, uh, and I ended up actually having my own my own technique by just moving the finger up and down. Mm. Okay, looking at the Turkish musicians, for example, that I figured out that they actually play like like this. So they play the the, the tremolo on the kanun by by holding the, uh, the, the the plectrum this way and uh, striking, let's say, the, the, the string uh, from the side, uh, which is very powerful uh, tremolo, very nice and has a specific effect. The, the technique that I uh, use is, is totally different. It was because I started actually practicing this way. I was thinking, why not, like the wood plays up and down, the kanun players usually play only I mean, classically, I mean, downwards, but why not upwards, you know? And this, now I can play with the, with the left and, uh, and, uh, and right uh, index finger. Um, so this comes, you need to, to practice, you need to, to, to do that, and you need to, 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 to search also for the, for the, for the, for the, um, uh, for the most suitable plectrum for that, because if you just grab any plectrum and start to play, it will it will stuck, you know. It will, it will not help you. So you need to, to find even the angle and things. And this comes only by by, by practicing. But the, I mean, the, the 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 things that that I practice now is indeed uh, more uh, less technical, but more musical. Mm -hmm. So the challenge, for example, is to. To, 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 to listen to, to somebody, uh, this might uh, sound blasphemic, <laughs> somebody, for example, reciting a Quran, and then pause, and then start to imitate or to play that. Yeah. Listen again, and then play the same, uh, the same thing. Work on the very tiny, very tiny details. And I'm, I'm still learning. I mean, I will never uh, master this. Uh, and I know that because also I, I don't have the, enough time to do so. But this is that now what, what I think is, 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 is what I need. And every student they have to, I mean, has to decide um, what is the most suitable and effective way to, um, uh, to practice. One last uh, thing I want to mention is that, uh, I don't know if, you, if you've noticed this, uh, but sometimes it is actually, at least from my, my own experience, it is healthy to uh, to distance yourself from both music and instrument. Mm -hmm. yeah. to, to take to take really maybe one week, two week, two weeks, or even longer without touching the instrument. You no, know? I don't want to. I want to. I don't want to give uh, any para, uh, I mean, <laughs> parody here. But uh, uh, when you come back to the instrument and play music, you enjoy it in a different way. So practicing every day, you know, touching the instrument every day, uh, maybe is not uh, as healthy as some people might think. It's good to take a kind of uh, German, we say Abstand. I mean, kind of a distance, um, uh, Abstinence, yeah. and then and then touch your instrument back. And you sometimes <laughs> notice that very nice, very nice ideas and. 
uh, or even things that you did not uh, were not able to play before yeah. suddenly uh, work. Nagar or Gerasimo? Gerasimo, would you like to say something? Because uh, I have to say, but I, I'm, I'm afraid it might get long, so please. <laughs> <laughs> so, I will be short. Uh, I'm thinking about what I call uh, practice on stage. Mm. So uh, I have this feeling that there are three, let's say three, um, groups of musicians you see some musicians that play i'm talking about folk music actually folk music where we have mainly uh, simple melodies so uh, not something special in technically or um, some minimal songs some when you play on taverna or, or something like this so you see some musicians just playing the notes mm -hmm. which is which is very bad, and uh, uh, it has it has to do has to do with uh, musicians uh, has to do with the level of the musician. You see some very early musicians playing like this, just the notes, and some musicians that played for let's say forty years, and they everything is dead on their on their hands. Everything is dead. No music at all. And um, then you, you see some other musicians trying to, um, to do a lot of things, to even to very, very simple forms, to play a lot of notes, a lot of notes, not ornamentations. And uh, I think that the, the final step and the, the best, um, when you, you, you consider yourself as good musicians, and when you, you are going to this, first stage uh, when it's a combination of imagination and minimalism that's my feeling and and this if you play along if you play the same pieces again and again and again and there is a stage when you are getting very bored playing the same songs and if you um go beyond this stage it's, sta it's starting rethinking and approaching these songs something it's like um meeting them again okay so something uh, re re renewing them mm -hmm. um and so at this first stage um you can be very minimal very creative and totally beyond notes that's my feeling and so this is something that you gain when you play a lot not practicing uh, home Playing a lot, the same, the same uh, um, songs again and again with different. Again, is the context with different uh, audience, different people around, and you see how the same song is different every time. Not only uh, in your hands, but in the faces of the of the people around. And uh, for me, this is uh, the the highest uh, stage when you feel the music. Um, in the moment, in this particular moment, as something new every time. It's the same song, new every time. Thank you very much. Very nice point. <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to, to uh, say something from my point of view plus my experience, and that would be putting practicing according to uh, how far you have gone let, let me put it uh, in, in in details if i'm a new learner of instrument of an instrument uh, the relationship between the instrument and my body is somehow the most important thing at that stage so uh, for me personally and for many others that i've uh, been in touch with uh, it, it was more effective when it, it repeated more often during the day that they they get in touch with the instrument again. So if they practiced uh, 10 times a day, each time 10 minutes, it was a lot more effective than doing the whole 100 minutes in one go. But then later, when, when the uh, posture thing and, and how to 
play the the picks and where to put the fingers is is gone and i mean that stage is uh, there and they can manage there are other things that become more important or and after you kind of feel comfortable with the instrument practicing has a different meaning that's what i mean so it it, it should be defined according to where you are in your journey let's say and there is a stage where you uh, would in my opinion you would practice at some hours and you would explore at some other hours and uh, sometimes you are exploring just in your head not necessarily with the instrument sometimes you are exploring what you had in uh, in your mind on the instrument and I, I call all of that kind of practicing. I mean, if you can use the same word for that. Uh, and um, sometimes I, I try to sing something differently and then want to explore that on the instrument with that different kind of singing. So it, it can go in all different uh, stages and different ways uh, from the in, uh, relationship between the instrument and the body to where it's totally in your mind. Uh, I, I don't think you can give one simple um, solution or, or recipe to everyone. And there was one other thing that I tried myself and I usually suggest to people around the, let's say, intermediate level of both dealing with the instrument and the content of music. And that is when I would um, limit myself, like I would say, okay, I play this phrase and I'm not allowed to play any tremolo, let's say. Or I play this, the phrase again, this time there is no vibrato, this is not allowed. Or I play it only with this uh, technique, whatever. And that brings some awareness, because a, a lot of these techniques become kind of a habit. But by limiting uh, what I'm allowed to do and what I'm not allowed to do, uh, it, it becomes more meaningful of what kind of uh, so-called technique I'm using on uh, one, one uh, phrase in repetitions and I will hear the result and then afterwards I can either choose one of them for uh, a specific interpretation of the melody or we'll just pass on to the next and, and it will become kind of like uh, an experience from before. So all these experiences are under the category of, of practicing for me. Interesting. Any other point about practice and efficiency? Uh, I think we covered most of the uh, discussion points. I will conclude maybe with one more final question here, which is the investment of a musician. A musician is investing in a lot of things. Musician, a performer, uh, composer, whatever it is, a singer, all sorts of things, maybe a polymath musician. Uh, what should be the focus of their investment? They might invest in instruments and in books and memorization of maybe exposure all sorts of things what do you suggest from your experience what did the time tell about investment very tricky question by investment uh, you mean that we really dedicate some time, uh, money time, to, money time, uh, time money dedication uh, efforts, energy. W what are we like spending our our efforts and and, and time Lifetime. and money? Yeah. <laughs> what should we focus on actually? I think well, I, I think it differs from person to person. It, it depends on the results we have seen and achieved, or maybe seen in our students or our colleagues, isn't it? I mean, from my own experience living in Germany and having to deal with, uh, with my neighbors, <laughs> I would invest in a, in a, in a practicing cell. <laughs> you should play saxophone for them. <laughs> or, or, or whatever, whatever, or investing in, I don't know, build, I mean, uh, designing a room special to, or maybe investing in, in a, in a, in a Rehearsal, rehearsal room somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and some people rent a, a garage for their car. I would maybe rent a small room where I can just play as loud as I can and uh, never. 
Yeah. You know, because it's, I mean, I mean, what do you do when you, when you get inspired at uh, 10 in the, at night or 11 at night? Yeah. What do you do? I mean, in Germany, it's impossible because you start hearing people I don't think on. there is. I don't think there is a mute <laughs> for a canon. Eh? There is no yeah. mute for canons. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and that's another another aspect that they start to to to, to listen to two very strange uh, <laughs> macabre sets and, and skills. I would definitely invest in a in a, in a rehearsal cell or whatever. <laughs> okay. In that context, we we have a joke, a musician's joke here in Greece, which is, "What is the difference between a musician and a pizza?" <laughs> pizza can feed a family. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Well, actually, um, so you would go for for uh, for more uh, fiscal investments in order to <laughs> <laughs> invest in pizzas, not in music. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good point. <laughs> no. Uh, this actually is a serious question, even though for making it sound ridiculous, or I am anyway. Um, well, I get people who sometimes ask me, you know, they're studying music and they, they ask me, should I, you know, give myself to music only? Should I just just do that and make that my profession, should I, should I, what do you think? And if ever I'm asked that question, I always avoid giving an answer. Because if you actually ask that question, it's not for you. The people who that's for are the ones who never ask that question, they just do it. And uh, because really, to become a musician and to make music, music your life and your profession is extremely difficult. Uh, it doesn't matter which society you're in, you know, certain countries are more difficult than others, of course, yes, but anywhere it's, it's difficult, it's not easy. Um, having done that, if you really want to do something in music, which is really going to be something, of, not just be a session musician, you know, you go to a studio and you play whatever they give you and uh, you don't care whether you like it or whether you don't like it, you know, uh, no, if you really want to do something which is your own thing and you want to find your music and go your own way, you have to avoid having alternatives. I mean, I know many musicians who, when they were young, they were you know, following their own way and they were discovering things, they were discovering their own path, but they were finding, you know, uh, economically life was difficult. I said, oh, okay, I'm going to go and work in a nightclub for four or five years. I'm not going to like what I play there, but I'm going to make some money. And then uh, after the four or five years, I'll have made money and I'll do exactly what I want. No one has ever done that. Uh, it doesn't work. Um, you have, to, And so that's why it's not a good thing to have this as an alternative or any such alternative, because you're going to come up against a difficulty in your path when... You, know, you have to get past this this blockage, this thing which is blocking you. And you're going to need every last drop of creative thinking which you've got to get past it. As they say, the, uh, the darkest moment is just before dawn. Yes, exactly. That's how it happens. So you get there. And if you have an alternative you think, and things are getting tough, you oh, okay, I'll just go back in here and I'll go back to the nightclub and do things. And you never find your way. To find your way, you have to have no alternative. And that's going to help you push past this thing which is in your way. And once you've done it once, you know that you can do it. And every, every time you encounter this blockage further down the road, it's a little bit easier each time to get past it. So for me, it's a question of what you really want to do. I mean, um, also there are varying degrees of what you want to do. Somebody may just want to learn to play an instrument just to enjoy himself and things like that. That's not a very big investment, and that's something which many people can. It's great. It's fine. It's perfect. But if you want to be a musician, you know, and you have this in you to be a musician, to, you're going to do something which is your thing, and you're going to, you know, maybe create music, or you're going to give your whole life to it. That isn't something which you decide to do. It's something which happens to you. 
and it's something which actually if it does happen to you there's no way to resist it and um, then you have to really dedicate yourself to it if that does that does actually happen to you wow if that does actually happen to you <laughs> see you in the next life <laughs> <laughs> that's certainly true yeah. uh, i wanted to add another aspect uh, and that is that with the world today with, uh, the way the world has become today it seems like one side investment seems to be making the right connections networking uh, I, I personally am not good at that. I know it, but it seems like this is what people need. I mean, as musicians, uh, they, they need to invest in connections uh, in, in whatever direction they want, of course. I mean, uh, it might be in, in uh, what, what I personally don't like, like doing these combinations of uh, fusion into this and that or whatever. But in any case, um, making the the network of people that would kind of um that would be an investment anyway it, it will become fruitful at some point i think that has become very uh, important and somehow necessary even maybe for the younger generations although i'm not personally good at that myself no nor yeah. am i uh, <laughs> uh, anything uh and salah <laughs> Uh, I would say that for me, yeah, yeah I totally agree with Rose that uh, it's no, there is no path to choose. It's just in front of you. If you want to do it, there is no, yeah, it, it's yourself doing this anyway. Um, and uh, so the investment is the second thought. It's not the first, it's the second thought. Mm. So for me, the second thought is to maybe to, sh to share a vision about the world through this, th through music. Mm. And um, it's a part of, it's a part of, for, for myself, uh, particularly a part of, uh, total creativity that I feel that I want to share. Uh, so for, for me, music is a part of my um, creativity mood and mindset. Uh, and so in this way, I feel that I, uh, that I invest on making music, on composing or uh, interpreting or uh, performing in order to to share to share things and share ideas and um, actually participate in the in the evolvement evolvement of the societies and the world, mm -hmm. because if you do something and it affects people, this affects people. It's like a political movement, mm -hmm. not because you want it to be like this. But it is if you if you don't do something in your room around four <laughs> a walls and no camera, uh, it's political. It's something that affects people. Mm -hmm. So you you di you direct it to a particular way that agrees in your philosophy in your. Uh, mindset in uh, what do you want to what do you want to share with people and uh, give your own idea about things interesting interesting anything else yeah. uh, before we conclude uh, on on investment or or in general in general <laughs> I, I would like to say something if sorry if I have been talking too much but well women are talkative anyway oh. by reputation <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to to ask uh, everybody's opinion on if I may call it the issue of the audience uh, 
Yeah. I mean, music is, um, it, it doesn't have to serve the function of entertainment, but it certainly needs an audience. Mm -hmm. uh, so music without audience is not really music. It becomes alive when there are listeners. Yeah. And um, I personally find it, uh, I mean, um, Although we are having, um, as we talked in the beginning, we are having this kind of developing uh, group of interested people, let's say, in the music. I'm not sure if we are having as much audience. Uh, what I'm witnessing is that people are more or less interested, well, many of them are more interested in what they are doing themselves and less interested or following what others are doing. Uh, and, and the younger generation is more, uh, I, at least the ones I know, they are more into that. They are more concerned or focused on what they, they and their friends are doing, and they are not uh, the audience to uh, the work of others. And that to me looks like a crisis of audience to come. And uh, I, I think it's important to attend to because as musicians, we are... Uh, well, bound to have some people to, to produce the music for. I, I don't mean to sell the music to, uh, that part aside, which is still important. But uh, before that, before even you think about the financial part, you need to think of some, some people, because in my opinion, whatever function the music is serving, it, it is made to be listened to. That is one thing I would like to have opinions on. And there's another thing which I... Um, I, I take from my experience or my perception of uh, how the audience, the majority of the younger generation of Iranians are responding to this type of Persian Dasgah music in the last 10-15 years or so. And that is um, what I would put on the change of discourse in, in the society. Iranian people are somehow uh, fed up with anybody who would lecture them. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling that many of the Persian Dasgah performers are somehow bringing that type of discourse or that type of relationship with the audience. So the younger generation is just saying that, come on, I don't want to listen to, to you lecturing me. I would go somewhere that I could scream. And these two, I think, are related. I mean, the, the issue of uh, how we relate in, in, in the context of uh, what I call discourse, and, and then also the crisis of audience. And I would love to hear opinions on these two. Interesting. Yes. Who is going to go first? Uh, yeah. Whoever likes. Just I'm thinking, way. yeah, I'm thinking that, uh, yeah, of course there is a crisis of audience, and um, because it's difficult uh, for for us, for the new generation, and I'm sure for the coming generation, to concentrate on something um, for a long time, and um, passively without doing something. Uh, there is a distortion of everything you, you see. You cannot focus even on on, on YouTube or uh, Facebook. Your focus is limited on, I think, three seconds. And then you go to the next one. So maybe for the uh, two generations later, uh, it will be a need of all, just to focus on one thing because of the overdose of all this information, maybe in some decades later. Um, but now th my feeling is that <laughs> audience, a good shift of audience is to be uh, participants. So to make an, an event and they, they, they are not just passive um, perceivers of what you are doing, but somehow part participants of this. And that's why I think the rock music or techno music um, have this, um, they are very popular, this popularity. Because you can dance and you can also dance without limits. Techno music has no rules on dancing. And so people feel that 
they they participate in this and also the dj that you told before uh, see what's happening see there is this connection uh, and so for me our musical idioms that are very the modal uh, idioms um, maybe ha has to be has to follow this direction on um, participation on uh, making ceremonies for people in order to at attract them <laughs> in order to uh, maybe I, I, I'm thinking this is also what I am I, I like to do so that's why I'm talking about this I also of course like uh, audience silent audience listening to music uh, but this is very rare today there are because People want to go out and, uh, you know, have fun. <laughs> have fun, yeah. <laughs> they are very pressed. They are very, yeah. Thanks for your opinion. Thanks for the question. <laughs> if I may, I mean, uh, I agree totally that. Uh, I mean, playing for an audience, be it one person or more, is very important because, I mean, the feedback that you get you know, drives you to maybe to play better, I don't know, uh, challenges you in a way or another. It's just like, you know, uh, watching a football match without audience. I mean, it's very boring, by the way. Um, for the players themselves, because this, I mean, I think it's one of the of the penalties, let's say, or the sanctions against uh, teams that they play without uh, without the fans, without uh, the supporters, you know, uh, because because everybody knows the impact of, 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 uh, of the fan. Um, so putting aside this uh, this. Um, uh, uh, um, for me, I sometimes enjoy more playing for few people who appreciate and interact just like in a living room, four or five aficionados sitting, sitting there, appreciating, singing, clapping, uh, uh, challenging you, than on a, on a big stage with, I don't know, 600 people. You know, uh, there's this distance. Our music is not made, my, my opinion, is not made to be played on big stages with, you know, with a, with a whole full of people. The intimer, the, the smaller the context is, the closer the people together, um, um, uh, uh, the better. And sometimes I play, I enjoy playing only for myself, actually. And uh, just, uh, I mean, uh, Ross, uh, Ross mentioned uh, uh, the, the, the aspect of recording yourself. I would add to that also playing in front of a mirror sometimes helps. Uh, just to see yourself actually, how you sit, how you react, how you, uh, how you I mean, the, the, whole, uh, um, the whole thing. Um, there was one point that I wanted to, uh, to mention. Uh, Yes, uh, I mean, uh, it's interesting that we, we have accounts, uh, historical accounts, for example. There's this anecdote about uh, Um Kulthum, a very famous Egyptian singer, um, who uh, went in her youth to sing in front of uh, uh, I an mean, audience in Jerusalem, in Palestine. And when she went back, she criticized the Palestinian audience because they were, of course, under Victorian uh, influence. Uh, they did not interact with her the way she expected. So she criticized said they have no idea, they know nothing about music because they just, you know, I mean, they treated her as a, as a, as, a, as an artist on stage. She sang, then they clapped, and that's it. You know, they did not just interact like the Egyptian Kyrene audience with her. So they were subject to critique by, by Uncle Thum. Another thing is, for example, the, the early recording industry, you know, when they placed those gramophones um, 
in front of the uh, musicians asking them to, to sing. Even the best musicians at the time, they had problems with that because they said, I mean, we need feedback, we need public. So the, the, this uh, Ali Jihad Rasi writes in his dissertation, uh, I mean, uh, they went out to the street and asked people to come into the studios in order to, you know, to encourage or like, oh, Allah, nice, uh, yeah. and, and so on. So the, 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 the singers and the musicians, they needed this feedback from the, uh, um, they needed audience in the studio. So the early, the earliest uh, recordings, they were with, with, um, I mean, audience. <laughs> Nowadays, you cannot, you cannot imagine, uh, I mean, going into studio and asking people to come with you just to record a CD or to record an album. Uh, okay, maybe the, the, some, some people record or make CDs out of uh, live performances, which are way better than uh, studio uh, recordings. I mean, these single live performances, because I think that audience plays uh, an important, vital, um, vital role. So, I mean, I totally agree. We musicians, we, we need, we need kind of, uh, I mean, uh, feedback, whether negative or positive. Interesting. Interesting. Rose, I think you have something to say. Well, I think um, when it comes to the question of, of an audience, uh, anybody who is in any form of performing arts, be it music or be it, uh, be it anything else, it's important to, to be aware of, do you have something to say and do you have someone who you feel it's meaningful to say it to? Um, that's, I think, where it starts. It's say in the metaphorical sense, because you're not actually speaking, you're playing. It's a bit more abstract. Um, I've often heard certain musicians who say, I don't care about the audience. I just want to play what I have to play. And if they like it, okay. If they don't like it, they don't like it. Other people say, I'll play whatever the people want. These are the two extremes. Um, and if there are people who support the one or the other side, that's, fair, that's fine. My own personal view is, are you able to put yourself in the position of the person who listens to you and to, to, to see, does this say something to me? Is it interesting? Is it boring? Uh, is it something, you know, there are certain things which are really, really fun for musicians to do, but they're absolutely horrendous for an audience to listen to. Free jazz. I'm sure it must be a lot of fun for the person doing it, but for the poor fellow listening to it, it's miserable. Um, and it's impossible, or contemporary classical music, <laughs> that's, that's even worse, actually. Um, it, it's hideous. It must be a lot of fun for someone to do it, but, I, but uh, certainly not to listen to. So there are things which are, you know, musicians really enjoy doing this stuff, but the audience hates it. And you have to have a certain awareness of that. But I think what you really have to, to have is you have to know who you're addressing and what you're addressing to them, uh, what you're giving to them. Of course, as I said previously, you know, the, you know, the, the virtuoso who's fallen in love with his fingers and treats his instrument like a Kalashnikov, he's going to sort of shoot you with it, you know, that, that nobody likes that. Um, that's totally meaningless. Each musician is in a position, I think, if they're in true connection with their art itself, they're in a position to give a unique experience to the person listening. So they have to believe in what they're doing. Um, they have to respect it. They have to know where and when to present it uh, and under what circumstances, because there are certain types of music which will work under certain circumstances, but not under others. Um, you know, I could take the example of uh, well, let's say the example of Iranian classical music, which is uh, rem truly remarkable music. That is not going to work in a taverna. Uh, you know, someone singing avaz or something. That, no, it requires a certain environment and a certain type of concentration. Uh, and so you have, to, you have to make sure that you protect your art from the wrong circumstances. So you present it in circumstances where it has a chance, at least. Uh, and so you have to know where it belongs. What uh, Salah said was also very, very relevant. 
which is that the type of music which most of us here play, which is you know modal music, tends to be small ensembles as a rule, uh, is actually at its most effective in relatively small environments, in small venues. Uh, you know, playing at football stadiums and things with a single setar is not a very good idea. Um, and uh, <laughs> some people imagine they can do it, of course, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yes, I mean, uh, I myself, you know, the music which I prefer to play, uh, I know that uh, I feel at my happiest in relatively well-designed theatres, preferably of an amphitheatrical nature, uh, going up to about 500 people, five, 600 people maximum. Above that, it starts to get chaotic and you start to lose contact. You, you, you know, the distance starts to get too big. It is a music which requires a certain intimacy with the audience. And so you have to be satisfied with that. Don't go and play in theatres of two and 3,000 people, imagining that that sort of flatters yourself. No, it doesn't. It, it, it's actually working to your detriment if what you're playing is not suitable for that environment. Um, so it requires that each person, each musician has a certain self-knowledge about themselves, about their art, about what they want to say, who they want to say it to, how they want to say it to these people. You have to have the whole picture there. And I remember <clears throat> I used to work in the 1980s with a very great uh, Greek, Greek uh, clarinet player called Vasili Soukas, who was an extraordinary musician, absolutely amazing, and a wonderful man also. And I remember going once to a concert at the Likavitos Theater here in Athens, a very big outdoor theater, uh, which had a capacity of about 4,000 people. And I listened to a concert of Ravi Shankar playing there with just two musicians, one tabla, one tambura. Uh, and, you know, it was a full theatre listening to this man play this very difficult and very complex music about which very few people in the audience had any idea, really. But he was very convincing and, you know, the people sat and listened to it and, you know, they, they enjoyed it. And, uh, and I remember thinking, well, my friend Vasily Soukas is no less of a musician than this man here. Why is it that he can do this and he can travel around the world playing this very difficult music for audiences in all over the world? Well, the simple reason is that because he believes he can. Uh, and of course, he, he, he was uh, an extraordinary musician, of course. Yes, you have to have quality. But beyond that, you have to actually believe in, in, in what you have. Uh, I often used to get asked here on Crete by people, they would you know, see me learning how to play lira and things like that. And you know, Crete, it's an island society, it's a closed society in many ways, especially in the years when I was learning here. And uh, they'd never ever encountered before somebody who was not Cretan who wanted to learn this music. And they found that very strange. And uh, sometimes they would ask me, well, I mean, do people in other places in the world, that they like our music? Uh, they couldn't actually understand that people outside of their community would actually like this. Um, whereas actually there is a, an audience anywhere for any music, uh, as long as the artist who wishes to present it is good, of course, is capable. And as long as this person has something to say and believes in what they have to say. Uh, so these are the things that I find to be of, uh, of, of significance. Uh, quite often, I think that a lot of artists suffer from a, a bit of a self-confidence program a pro problem in a way. That, uh, well, they sort of in front of it, how do are they going to understand what I'm going to play? Are they going to enjoy this? Or No, you don't think about that. Go there, play it, you know, and, and do it. And that has a certain power to it, which will bring people along with you. Yeah, that's what I think. Great, thanks. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, I think it's time to conclude. Uh, before uh, conclusion, I think it's uh, an opportunity to mention the summer 
uh, seminars happening in Labyrinth. Uh, Rose, if you could shed some light yes, on that. Yes, they will start in, they, they will start in July. Congrats on that. <laughs> oh. oh, thanks very much. Thanks. Uh, yeah, you know, we're getting back to sort of normal activity after, you know, we had the two years of COVID. And then, of course, uh, our building was almost completely destroyed by the earthquake. Um, and so we're going to move into a new building this year. And we're also doing seminars in the other village of Anoya, which is it's a very interesting village, actually, yeah. um, of the great musical history. And uh, so we're gradually getting back to what we might refer to as normal activity. If there's anything even remotely normal about our activity anyway but it, uh yeah it's, <laughs> so that will start back to I normal think, activity. Uh, <laughs> will start in, in early in july, july in and july. it goes to the end of uh, september or well actually uh no there's a big difference now that we have a new building which has plenty of teaching space in it we're no longer obliged to use the village school mm. which that limited to, to us to two months every year yeah. So we're now going to be operating all year round. Yeah. Wonderful. And uh, so it's going to present nice. many, many, many more opportunities for many more people to teach and yeah. many more students to come at different times of the year. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. Hopefully we meet there somehow, <laughs> sometime. Yes, you're all, you're all welcome. I'm very much looking forward to seeing any of you who come our way. You're going to be very welcome. And, uh, Wonderful. And, uh, Really, thank, thank you very, you very much, much uh, for Rose, organizing Nagar, this. Salah, and thank you, uh, thank you this for was, the invitation. This was really a very, very interesting uh, discussion to me. Hard to conclude, <laughs> but <laughs> we will meet again, uh, either on individual we'll sure. uh, basis or a group basis. And uh, I encourage the uh, viewers and friends of Anadi to go and see the previous uh, interviews with the, with our guests and. Uh, we will meet soon. I would also like to thank you for all these episodes now that it's the yes. hundredth. So you, it, it's quite a lot of uh, achievement. I mean, not, not only a lot of work, but also you have achieved a lot. Thanks yes. a lot for that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Good, great. Lovely okay. okay. to meet you all. Great to see you Especially all. Especially yeah. Ross, I, we haven't we hadn't met for quite some time. It we was great. Met, yes, yes, yes. We have to we have to meet up. Uh, I'm very much definitely. I would love to. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Great. Um, uh, yeah. My greetings to Sebastian. Yeah, yeah and one thing. Uh, uh, regards from the other room. <laughs> he came back. And he's oh, 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 thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I you I used to play with uh, Adel Salami. Ah. Oh yes, yes. yeah, and and he He's every every time we played together, he said you should meet Ross, you should meet Ross. He was at some. Yeah. I think that uh, eventually we met. Yes, online, but person, but, uh, for sure. Uh, yes. soon, uh, yeah. 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 yeah, peace be upon him. So yes. poor poor other, he he left us far too early. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. It really struck us. He was a good man. Yeah. Yes, yes, very yeah. fine. Yeah. yeah. Well, right. thank you, Pablo, for uh, the invitation you. and uh, congratulations on your hundredth uh, episode. Thanks to you. Yes. Thanks to you all. Thank you very much. Bye for now. Bye. 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 Good evening. Bye. Bye. Bye.